producer Paul. All right, let's get back to some boring subjects. Understand the risk to our country. Freedom brings people together. You're listening to the We Are Libertarians Network. Learn more at wearelibertarians.com. Hey, that's my turn. Welcome to We Are Libertarians. This is episode 363, recorded on August 7th, 2019. My name is Chris Bangle. I'm the host. Got a cast of characters tonight to talk about very serious subjects. Uh, the one and only Tad Western is in the studio. Tanner Purdue is back. Yes, sir. A guy named Todd. Ty- Quiet. That's a guy good. named Kyle is here uh, who made a great first impression. And then uh, Harry is on the phone, uh, is on the uh, Zoom. So we'll get started here in just one minute. Warning. Warning. This show is for adults, produced by semi adults. So the language is sometimes strong and offensive. Uh, I don't know what I said. Uh. Welcome to We Are Libertarians, where our goal is to help you sound smarter while talking to your friends. We examine current events from a libertarian perspective while treating modern politics with all of the irreverence it deserves. There has been lie after lie. We toss out the screaming heads, put people before political parties, and give context to the news to make you think. Now, here's our host, a 15-year veteran of politics and media, Chris Spangle. Hello, everybody. Uh, that is me, Chris Spangle, here on the We Are Libertarians Network. Uh, we are in, we finally added all of the new shows to all of the directories. So go to any directory and just search We Are Libertarians and you'll see all our shows. The Swamp Explains, Genderarchy, Libertarian Politics and Policy, The Boss Hog, Tad Talk. You'll see all the shows in there. Uh, all the ones that are going and then Tad Talk. And uh, t- to subscribe to the whole bunch there or you can go to WeAreLibertarians.com. But that is not why we are here. We're here to have fun. We're here to uh, possibly make love. But first, let's introduce everybody just so we're on the same page. The lovely and effervescent Tad Western is back. Tad, it has been quite a while. How are you doing? Doing well. How are you, uh, Mr. Spangle? I am. Uh, listen, it's show night. I get, I get tense. I get irritable. I you're, and pretty, you're pretty stressed out. I'm going to take it out on our next guest, which is Tanner Purdue. Tanner, how are you? The one, the only, I'm here. And thank you, Chris Spangl, for having me on. And thank you even more to Tad Western for being here. Yeah, oh, you're welcome. It's so, my pleasure. Tad, I'm just here to uh, keep you two apart. Tad started screeching about uh, the shootings, and I was like, just come on in. Uh, no, I wasn't screeching. I, was... <laughs> I needed somebody who actually has been on 8chan before, and I know you've been on. So uh, so that's why Tad's here. Uh, Harry Price, the, the one and only Harry Price is on Zoom. Harry, how are you doing? Going good, going good. Sitting here in the... Uh... My other studio. Now you attempted to be an hour late uh, because you were feeding Gunther, but I was like, "Just zoom in." I'm like, "I'm not waiting for you." And then it took me twice as long to set all the equipment up. Uh, so, yeah, very long. So, if you're a patron, five dollars abo- above a month, you get like fifteen to twenty minutes extra. As we're kind of sitting here and I'm getting set up and everybody's chit chatting, you get that bonus content as well as extra shows. Um, and so Harry, we get a long one because it took me forever to get this new setup going. Um, but Harry has not been kidnapped. He is not sitting in a red porta potty. He is not, uh, he's just up against a black red curtain with some very harsh lighting. And it looks like he should hold up. He's holding up a newspaper. Uh, all right, good. I just wanted to make sure that you have not been kidnapped by the Viet Cong. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm safe. Uh, I, I, I actually kind of like the red curtains. I tried to use some in the staging, and everyone's upset. Now, the lighting, yeah, I, you know, I haven't set the lights up yet. You look good. You look like you're getting ready to go on a ski trip or something. Right. <laughs> you do. That's you a toboggan. It, the air set at seven, uh, 65 in here, so you really picked a good night to not come in. Oof. Oh, that's too cold. That's Are way you guys too cold? cold? I'm comfortable. I'm doing all right. All right, good. Now, that other voice is Kyle Orr. Yes. Is that how you say it? I haven't said your last name. You're going to have to talk right into the mic. You can move it if you need to, but you need to look like you're pretending to make mm. sweet, passionate mouth love sweet, to that microphone. Love to the right. Mic. So uh, I'll turn you up a little bit. Uh, Kyle, I have never met, but he. Yeah, that's the first time. Yeah, yeah he is uh, a f- Facebook friend of mine. Yeah. Shares pretty shares pretty much everything. Comments on pretty much everything. I try to be pretty active on it. All right. Yeah. Uh, even closer to your mouth. Like if you got a yeah. like 
Like Tanner, show him how to do it. Look, see how Tanner is. That's how I want this you. Is better. That's perfect. Yeah, yeah check, 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 check. All right, there we go. Yeah, that's better. See, we don't we don't uh, edit here. I live mix everything, and Absolutely. so that's why you get everything in in the mix. So, uh, some people are more professional. Johnny Rocket has a damn near uh, seven hour production every week. I don't do that. I have seventeen jobs, so we we live mix here. Uh, Kyle made a great first impression. He uh, walked in. He said, hey, what's up, man? And then proceeded to destroy my bathroom. <laughs> it was like Hiroshima in yes. there. It, it was disgusting, you know. Yeah. I, I I tried to tell him to do it at Culver's. Yeah. He managed to order a triple bacon cheeseburger, butter burger. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he had to make room, apparently. Uh, it couldn't couldn't hold. Are you lactose intolerant? Is this? No, man, it's just all the soda, dude. All you right. Too much sugar. <laughs> <laughs> you never walked into a stranger's house and just immediately lost your bowels, Harry or Tad? In, no, but I did uh, walk into a shop in uh, Nashville, Tennessee, and they had a private bathroom, but I just walked in. And well, that was a shop. Up. Yeah, I mean, no, but it was a private bathroom, and they were having like a little church group thing going on the oh, back, man. and it was you know, it a, was bad. A quote on the way over here was, hey, <laughs> you don't think Spang will care that I blow up his bathroom? Yeah. <laughs> I swear to God, that's, that's, that's a quote. Some premeditated terrorism. Is what that is a said. quote. That, that's the best terrorism yeah. I've ever seen it before. So yeah. You just, yeah. So you just, hi, my name's Kyle. I'm gonna destroy your bathroom. That was. <laughs> <laughs> there not, has been one positive though. I haven't seen the cats in a long time. They, I think they might have suffocated. <laughs> yeah, they're dead. Cyclone ass came out of me. <laughs> gas the cats to death. Uh, yeah, no, but you were not the first. Uh, you're not the only person to do that. The other person that did that was Chloe <laughs> Anagnos, <laughs> the beautiful, lovely uh, beauty queen who is a fantastic writer and uh, of of such stature now. But back when she was around us, she was just herself. And boy, uh, she I love Chloe. Uh, all right. Lots going on in this episode. We're going to talk about the shootings. Uh, we've got a ton of great prep from our uh, research team, specifically our uh, research director, Sam Schultz. And uh, Sam, by the way, if I say it's, it's Schultz or Schultz and I say it wrong for the last six months, please make sure you correct me. Um, but So we're going to give you the details on exactly what happened because the thing that I think most people find in this particular situation is that they – uh, they, they hear there are shootings and they have absolutely no idea what's going on. You know, they're all white supremacists or they're all l liberal or it's all used for, as a political football. So we're going to give you all the details of exactly what is happening uh, and maybe talk a little bit. If we have time tonight, talk a little bit about why somebody becomes a shooter. If we don't get to that, we will do that on Saturday. Now, on Saturdays, I'm going to... Listen, I've made no secret that my goal in life is to eventually have my own talk radio show. And I initially, I started in 2004 at a local talk radio show. Uh, I work in talk radio now, albeit a comedy format, not a political talk format. And I, a few years after leaving that local talk station, started this podcast as a way to kind of just keep my chops up and talk about issues and have fun. And uh, so I need to get accustomed to actually being quick and on time and keeping to a schedule and a format and so on saturdays i'm going to be practicing that so we'll be doing uh essentially the chris bangle show live on saturdays usually around noon so check for the we are libertarians twitter you can grab that live uh link the, you can hear it live you can call in interact with us and uh we're gonna start keeping the phones open so if you want to respond directly to anything we're saying on the show listen live uh, you can watch it live in our Facebook group if you're $10 a month and above patron. Uh, $5 a month above patrons get all the bonus content and uh, all kinds of goodies if you go check out our Patreon. Uh, and, and let me thank everybody. I want to make sure that I grab the new person uh, who just joined the Patreon. I did not write down. I normally have notes on this stuff, and I have not updated it with the brand new person, and I greatly apologize. See, smart people, Tad, would not say that. Like, hey, I have not memorized the new person's name yet. Well, so. Honesty is always the best policy. Exactly right. I'm not a great broadcaster yet. Unless you, it's going to piss somebody off. Then you should just always lie. I'm the world's okayest broadcaster. They uh, truly deserve an episode of Tad Talks. They do. Why, why have you not been doing Tad Talk, Tad? You, you literally haven't worked. You haven't been doing shit for well, a Well, I haven't now. been doing work. What are you, my wife's? I've been yeah. doing things. There's a <laughs> lot of things to do around the ranch. You have <laughs> Now, like, technically, might not be compensated with monetary 
uh, gain from it. You feed, your dog, you feed your dog pepperonis and you go work out, and that's <laughs> all you do. And then you go talk to boomers at bars. Like, don't I give do. me this. Hey, it's a lot of work, man. Don't pretend you do shit. No. Time. It's a lot of work. You know, I mean, I think I woke up at 2 o'clock this afternoon. Harry, please change the battery in your smoke. I told detector. you. I told you. That is not me. That is Harry. <laughs> Harry I told you. You have children. <laughs> he did say that. <laughs> burn your house down. How, how do you live having that beep in the background and not drive you crazy? What I noticed that 15 minutes ago. So, <laughs> All right. I have a 9 volt. Um, Come on. Take one out of that headset, that fancy headset. It's tradition to have that thing going now. Uh, it's been going for so long. I think, like, uh, if you listen to any of my first podcasts, it still be it would beep in there. Like ten years ago, when I first started podcasting, oh, fucking fire hazard. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just shocked. It's still going. It is still beeping. Mister Safety comes over here every single time. And is like, oh, you need to make sure you lock this down. Your internet is not secure. Why don't you put a bar on this door? You you haven't changed the battery in your smoke detector? It's the one in the basement. Yeah, okay. Where That's you where lit- the most fire start. Exactly. Where all your equipment is. What are you doing? There's uh, another one in the other room next to the furnace. That's perfectly fine. All those plugs, all he, those plugs, Harry, like, hey, all plugged hey, into one outlet. That's it's just my son's fire hazard. Room. It's just my son's room. Right. <laughs> we don't need a smoke detector in there. <laughs> <laughs> This you know, one of my favorite conversations I've ever had with Harry was him talking about how he could turn anybody's internet off and how he could make my internet the most secure motherfucking broadband there ever was. And it was right, that classic. sounds like a fascinating conversation. I, I almost <laughs> fell asleep, but it was fucking <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so, all right, thanks to our patrons, the lovely Christy Avery. I just want to give a shout out to Christy Avery. She's just, I hope... That at some point in your life, you have a friend as good as Christy Avery. And then, uh, just like my friend Lex, I posted about them yesterday. They're just great friends who always support our work, support me. Just really happy that Christy Avery is not just our friend, but also a patron supporting our work. Uh, I, I just did a bonus episode uh, on exactly where our Patreon money goes and what we're using it for. So, if you're like, hey, I want to give, but here's where your money's going. Here's what we spend it on, and here's all the growth, and here's the libertarians that we're creating on a daily basis. Like, Think about shaving off some of that libertarian party donation money and putting it towards something effective. Uh, so Christy Avery and Craig DaCosta and Jason Doolittle, they've been longtime $100 a month subscribers, and we really do appreciate it. And creeping in there is the Libertarian Coalition and our buddy Donald and and everybody over there at the Libertarian Coalition, their goal is to bring libertarians and people together around ideas. So make sure you look up their Facebook page. Uh, Jeff Bennett is our new patron. Thank you so much for joining the, at the $100 a month level. And Ed Brehob, our buddy intern Ed, such a good guy. And we're so happy to have him supporting the show. So thank you guys for being patrons of the program. Um, you know, I... We, I, I'm going to read the $25. Listen, I know it's early, and there's a lot of these, but these people deserve recognition too. It's not just the $100 people, but you know, the one, five, ten, twenty-five hundred dollar people. They really do make a huge impact, and all this growth that we're going on, uh, undergoing right now, is really because of people like Josiah Shrewsbury, Andrew Bowman, Paul Jonathan Eads Jr. Ryan Lindsay, Liberty Memes, yes, that Liberty Memes supports us, Ray Wolf, Mario E., Rob Place, Reinhold, uh, Catherine Iverson, Richard, uh, The Liberty Extract, Michael Schulteis, Joshua Sexton, Jacob Klingensmith, Rick Irvine, Carly Ernst, Brandon Kester, Heidi Aldridge, Dan Dunbar, Christopher Brokoff, and Amazeus, uh, a.k.a. Todd Singer. So thank you guys so much for supporting the program, and we really do appreciate everybody who keeps this running. Um, so before we be- begin, I, I want to talk about something a little sensitive, and I think it ties into the subject. Uh, it's, it's personal, and it is something that uh, Tanner has wanted to come on and address for a very long time. Uh, and I do, I do think it kind of feeds into the broader topic that we'll be discussing tonight. Um, you know, Tanner, how old are you? I'm 22. I turned 23 like next week. Pull that mic. Just tilt that mic up for me, please. I'm 22. I'll okay. turn 23 like next week. Okay. So you're a young man. 
Uh, you've you've lived a hard 22 years, to be honest. Uh, I've lived all of them. <laughs> right. Yes, especially the last few. And uh, a lot of a lot of discussion is going into, um, you know, what what is basically lost young men. And why do they turn to certain things? Right. Uh, and Kyle, you know, we, we haven't really done a good introduction of you, but feel free to kind of jump in as Tanner's friend as we go through this and just say, like, hey, from my perspective, X, Y, and Z. Um, oh, God. I'll give, you, I'll give you a better <laughs> introduction than, hey, he shit in my bathroom in a minute. <laughs> um, this dude clogs toilets. Right. Uh, so you, you – obviously, you sound like a stoner. You have a stoner's voice. You do not use any drugs, correct? I'm not anymore, no. Right. Uh, although I, d I will say right now, I, I miss my marijuana. <laughs> um, and I'll get it back. Uh, Tad, do you believe that? Once this 10 years is Oh, up. 100%, I believe it. Yes. So we, one of the best episodes we ever had was our 420 episode with Tanner oh, and man. James Neese. I think it was 20. Is he still alive? Yes, 2016, 2017. That's and the last time I was on. Yeah, well, maybe I think the next one. But Tanner, Tanner had a great episode where we talked about drug legalization and then – Dog the Bounty Hunter's wife. Yeah, and, and I just want to give her a shout out real quick. And you know, I, I heard they were uh, examining John Dillinger's body, and I have I've, I've got this crazy request. That Where's they, this going? They exhume <laughs> Beth the Bounty Hunter's body, so they can figure out how to give every woman <laughs> her tits. Okay, stop. And <laughs> so, great episode. And so I invited you back. And what I didn't – like, I have never used any drugs, and so I'm not around drugs. I'm not sophisticated when it comes to any of it at all. I thought on your next appearance you just got – you smoked too much weed. And <laughs> you were just – you nodded off a little bit. You were kind of falling asleep. You were <laughs> acting weird. And, like, I was just like, man, this – the edibles really fucked Tanner up bad. Right. And it came – you know, and if you – I don't know, weeks, months, or whatever, you said, no, I wasn't, I was doing more than weed. Yeah. And so yeah. what, what were you doing? And I, I know first it's important to you to apologize. I, you've apologized to me and I've accepted that. And like, you were going through something like, you know, oh, and, and I felt bad that you were even on once I found out what was happening because the goal is not to ever use you as a character. I mean, we're all about real people here, and I felt terrible about it. But, like, you know, because people kind of messaged me after going, like, hey, that, 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 wasn't, that, 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 that wasn't weed. Hot. You should check on your friend. And right. so we kind of behind the scenes talked to family members and stuff and said, yeah. hey. Um, but, the, you know, it, I didn't realize you had a serious problem. Uh, it was very serious. And, and you know, um, it, it was one of those things that uh, I have a really messed up body the way it is. I've got a spine issue with my back. And at the time, I was dealing with an ACL reconstruction surgery, I right. believe, at the time. And, you know, I would use every excuse in the book. You know, it, it was this, it was that. But until you wake up and you cannot get out of bed without having some sort of drug in your system and you're a slave to that chemical you don't really you don't really recognize how serious your problem is and um honestly being on this show was a a big wake up call um not not only to me but people around me cuz i remember i had a doctor's appointment the next day and i i went in there and he had seen the episode and uh he was about to fill my anxiety prescription, and uh, he he was just, he, he said there was just no way that he was gonna let me on that because he he knew that I was gonna misuse it, mm. and uh, you know, and I I used all of those ailments, quote unquote. That I, I use them as an excuse to get messed up, and um, you know, I'm really torn between the whole the whole uh, disease versus choice argument. Which I don't believe people are born destined to get screwed up in life. But at the same time, I don't think people. Re some people realize how bad off they are until they wake up with a needle in their arm. You know, um, which, you know, 
March 22nd is two years, so um, it's not an issue anymore, thank God. But it, it took a lot of serious help to, to get where I am now compared to where I was at the time. So. so you started, because of the pain, you probably you started on opioids and then it ended in heroin? Is that kind of the, the trajectory? Oh, I, I started um, the 2015, I snapped my arm in half in a jiu-jitsu competition. And I was prescribed 120 milligrams of hydrocodone, hydrocodone every day. I would take three Norco 10s when I woke up every morning, three at lunchtime, three when I got home, drove home from school, and then three before I went to bed. And then the doctors cut me off cold turkey. And then I couldn't find the hydrocodones on the street. I could find the morphine. And the morphine was a lot easier to find. It was a lot cheaper, and I wouldn't get sick from it. How, how would you find it and from whom? <laughs> I, I'm not gonna say it for my drug dealers. I, I mean, but but like, was it clinics or was it just like private? It was street dealers. Okay. It was street. It, it was. Uh, what, why were you? Why did you two start laughing? But like, uh, what, what are you a fucking cop? <laughs> Damn it! I'm an arc. I'm not. I'm not gonna say who or what who I was buying it from. Or I can tell you the price I was buying it at. But I mean, let's hear it. Um, a hundred milligrams of morphine, which uh, is pretty much milligram per milligram, the same as hydrocodone if you take it by the mouth. Um, about a dollar or uh, a third, thir 30 cents a milligram. So about a, a morphine hundred would cost about $30. Mm. Whereas a hydrocodone 10 milligram would cost up to $7. And I just, it, it wasn't able, I wasn't able to find hydrocodones on the street. I ended up graduating to morphine. And then when I couldn't find the morphine, there was uh, a heroin dealer. And I ended up meeting the heroin dealer. And uh, I tried it once, I snorted it, um, ended up getting hooked like a fish, absolutely hooked on it. And then uh, I ended up putting it in my arms. Um, and uh, How long did that go on? Honestly, it didn't go on too long because I would have died. Um, I, can, I can still see the look on my mom's face because there's a period there for about four probably four weeks or so where she knew I knew everyone knew what was going on, but I wasn't willing to accept that fact. And then there was just one day I ran out of money. I, there was no way I was going to get, get, get well that day. And, um, that's when I, I just decided to stop. I, I didn't go to rehab. I locked myself in the room, told my parents what was going on. And I've always been a mama's boy. I'll admit that. Um, you know, I, I just locked myself in the bedroom and uh, dealt with the withdrawals. And uh, about four, I think it was three or four days later, I was outside smoking or something. And uh, it felt like something just hit me in the chest. I started crying uncontrollably. And uh Something just, you know, told me everything was going to be okay. And uh, it was like a spiritual awakening in a way, as crazy as that sounds. And uh, I, it's, it's weird because the day before that happened, a friend had asked me if I wanted to go to church with him. Mm. I was like, there's no way in hell I'm going to church. I'm withdrawing right now. I'm trying to get off dope. And um, the week after that, I was at church. And... uh I still go to this day. I got baptized on July 1st of 2018. And uh, it's one of the best days of my life. So at this point, I can look back on that and uh, say it was a wild ride. And I wouldn't change it for the world because I learned a lot about myself. And I learned uh, compassion for others. Do you still struggle? I mean, do you still like, uh, I mean, do you still struggle with your addiction? Uh, every great while, there'll be like, um, there'll be something that sneaks up on you. And it's almost like a bee sting. Real quick, it'll just come up on you and just tap you on the shoulder. And um, it's just something you have to block out. Um, I relapsed one time about six months in on morphine, not with heroin, but 
with morphine, which is equally as bad. And I've done every drug from A to Z. I've literally done everything. And um, it, it, it just, it, it's such a sensitive topic to a lot of people because a lot, pretty much everybody knows somebody that's going through it. And you don't realize how bad off you are until somebody else says, hey, you're fucked up. Mm. Or, sorry. You, you, you're, curse, you're, really, yeah. you're really messed up. Yeah. And um, that, that's when I really realized that I looked down and saw the, saw the mark on my arm and had, knew I had to make, it, make a change or I would end up dead. Do you think that it was just that it, it's like you, you still weren't so deep in it, but you were kind of cognizant in the beginning that you just were like, I, I can't I can't let this go further. Like this is serious shit. I mean he was this, aware. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Kyle. Uh, he he would mention that he would want to stop, you know, but it was hard. I mean, obviously it's hard. Uh when you become dependent upon it just to get out of bed. Um Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, no, uh, you're good. And he'd mention it to me you know, often. Um uh, more directly into the mic though. And uh and then finally he did it, which, you know. So what would he say to you? He's like, he, like he, wants, he wanted to stop. He, yeah. wanted to, he really wanted to stop. He just, he struggled with finding the, trying to find the word, the, the, the fortitude to actually go through with it, you know, because it's such a difficult, like he would have to lock himself in his room. And, you know, and then that, that's what he did. I mean, how many days did it take for you to get right? Um. Well, see, see, during this time that we're talking about, um, Kyle actually lived at one of the most toxic places I've ever been in my life. Really? What? In what way? Was it because he, of his he, shit? My roommates. Oh, okay. His his roommates yeah. were also. See, I tried to make a joke to lighten the mood, but they they were. <laughs> <laughs> no, right. so your roommates just were were selling, well, dealing. Well, 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 I don't want to get into. Too yeah, but they were no oh, fuck those guys they, well <laughs> honestly they, they weren't helping him you know right they, they weren't they weren't helping anyone. you know it, if you see that your friend's like really, really struggling i mean you wouldn't want to you know give them more dope right <laughs> you know but um, you also don't want to sit there and see them suffer yeah and um coming off of an addiction it's it's not good to be around it, people that are doing you know, the same that, shit yeah. it, it's completely impossible almost you know um like just that feeling on you know they it, it if anybody out there struggling with it if you can put two days together you can do it right and at the end of the third day if you're on opioids you're gonna make it you just have to convince yourself that you're strong enough you know, there's, there's this, this fucking show. It's like the most serious, one of the most serious episodes in a long time. Yeah, and then you toss a cat across the room <laughs> like a cam girl. I, I'm sorry, Tanner. I didn't mean to no, interrupt. I, you're fine. Yeah. But no, I just want to be that person that I wish I had at the time. Um, it, at the end of the third day, you can do it. You just have to just tell yourself that you can. Surround yourself with positive people. Stay away from the tos toxicity of others. And, you know, make, make sure that you have friends that have your best interest in mind. And uh, at the time, I didn't have that. So what are some more ways that you've kind of supported yourself as you've worked through this? What, what should people kind of look for in terms of, you know, there may be somebody listening right now who's going through this or, you know, even love someone who is struggling with opioids, you know, it, who it was more in the Kyle situation. What are some ways from both of you that – what are good ways to support somebody in that situation? I mean, I, I, was, I was more on the receiving end of, of the – Let, of me, the let me start here. Kyle, <clears throat> how do you deal with it emotionally, mentally? I imagine you just wanted to beat the shit out of him sometimes. You just wanted to go, dude, you're fucking uh, – like, Tell the guitar but, story. But then there's other times where you're just like – it's a, a tremendous amount of empathy. Like how, how did you handle having a friend on opioids, wanting to help him, but knowing he's just being the, he's in the disease right now. He's stubborn. He's not listening. Well, I know that if someone's on drugs, they're not going to help themselves unless they really want to help themselves. So absolutely, I try not to take like a 
I try not to be pushy with it. You know, I just give the best advice I can. And, you know, I just told him the way I quit cigarettes, I just quit. Like I, I had to make a choice to just quit. I told yeah. him, if you just got to quit, you got to want to do it. If you right. don't want to do it, you're not going to do it. And it's that simple. Um, and I just told him kind of, it's kind of the same thing you just said, you know, I explained it differently. I He's used like a being, ship metaphor. I told yeah. him, you know, you gotta, you gotta pick the people that you want on your ship with you. Yeah. You know, you don't want anyone on there that's, that's drilling holes in in your life and and wanting you to sink you know and so when he was ready you're you being a loving empathetic person just saying hey like not shaming him for not judging him necessarily yeah. just saying here's how i did this here you can do it encouraging him and then when it was time he he you were there for him and he knew he could reach out, reach out to you is that fair to say tanner yeah i mean absolutely um but at the end of the day it wasn't kyle's decision yeah, Kyle would have been friends with me whether I was strung out on heroin or not. It, it was my decision. It it wasn't my parents' decision. I could have slung dope my whole life, and made made myself um, get by that way. But that's not how I wanted to live. And after others started pointing out to me what was going on, it it made a lot more sense. And, you know, it, it's easy to get torn up in this argument. Is it a disease? Is it a choice? It's really, you know, I think it starts out as a, a, a choice that turns into a fucking disease because nobody wants to wake up and have to stick a needle in their arm or right. snort a line or take a pill. But at the same time, you know, everybody makes that initial decision whether the doctor gives them the prescription or they buy it on the street. Right. And it, it escalated very quickly for me. And um, I, I, think, I think all this suboxone, all this is just bullshit. It's just as addictive as the original opiate. I think that the, I don't think the NA or AA, any of that is really that important. I think you have to find a spiritual... Narcotics Anonymous, Alcoholics Anonymous, that stuff. Right. Okay. I've never been to a meeting in my life. I've had good friends. I've had bad friends. And that's what's going to determine your, your outcome is how you surround yourself with people that you do, you decide to. Yeah. So if I'm going to go hang out at the trap house, I'm probably going to go do some dope. If I'm going to hang out with people that are like-minded that like and that have similar hobbies that I truly had before I got into it, such as music. You're going to find me playing guitar, singing. That's what I do today. I, I play music. I think that's kind of relatable to a lot of the, the mass shooter subject and the whites, you know, white supremacist and ISIS. And like, it, it's a lot about what is the group of people that you're going to start surrounding yourself with, making that early correct choice. Absolutely. You know, I think in any situation, it's like choosing to lurk on some of these websites and entertaining certain ideas that you know, like, ah, this is edgy, this is edgy. I mean, it, it leads to a dark place, going to places that you know you shouldn't go. I mean, everybody, everybody has those choices. That's what I find so amazing about like the gun control argument. You know, it's not about like, it's about young men turning to violence and which is kind of what we're going to talk about uh, or people who use drugs or whatever. There isn't a person on the planet that doesn't struggle with something and has to make the choice every single day. Absolutely. Am I, you know, like if you're a married man, are you going to engage with that girl on Instagram? Are you going to slide in that DM? Like when you know Damn you should, <laughs> right. You know, Thought Slayer 69. Are you going to make that joke to the per to the coworker that you kind of know you sh shouldn't, but maybe she'll get the hint. Like, uh, help me. I mean, the other stuff, <laughs> like everybody struggles with choices. You know, for me, it was always emotional eating. It was overspending, you know, uh, I don't feel very good about myself right now. Am I going to go to Cracker Barrel and eat 5,000 calories or am I going to pray? Am I going to go for a run and exercise? Absolutely, yeah. What, you know, everybody has, you know, uh, you, you, you have coping mechanisms. Correct. Absolutely. And, and you choose good coping mechanisms or bad coping mechanisms. Go ahead, Harry. I forgot you were here. 
Oh, I was saying like everybody has something to reset themselves, whether they got something constructive to reset themselves or something that's destructive. Some people play video games. That's why some people, the first thing they come home, they want to play some video games because it's just some something they can do that's a little bit mindless to let them meditate. Okay. Yeah. Like, well, they're just mindless doing that. Well, well, if that's how they meditate, let them meditate that way. You know? Somebody, I actually just read an article that like some of these games, like, uh, you know, I play Clash of Clans and I play Fishdom, which oh, is Oh, you a play stupid, Clash? Yeah. I have for like, you know, 10 years or uh, yeah, I really like, um, I'm on there too. what, what, what is Rageosaurus the, Rex? Rageosaurus Rex. That's a good name. Uh, <laughs> Kingdom Rush. Those mindless little games like that or uh, uh, birds. I love Kingdom Rush. They're supposedly better for, um, they're supposedly better for stress release than Calm and Abide and some of these other apps that are built for stress relief. Correct. I, I prefer yeah, paladins. There's, there's for, nothing better than shooting people. For yeah, paladins, digitally. Right. Somebody's that, was a, that was a joke. We'll, <laughs> we'll address that later. Uh, at the staff meeting, uh, Tad. Yeah, Harry. I, I mean, digitally. Harry, everybody's got good coping mechanisms and bad coping mechanisms. And it really comes down to everybody lives in a moment by moment choice of are you going to choose the decent path or are you going to choose the path that indulges your inner, your, your base self? Correct. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and the other coping mechanism, like some of them use, is alcohol, which it shows also like Tanner's whole like uh, th that uh, journey. If he, he would have been addicted to alcohol, locking yourself in a room would have killed him. Yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's hard. I mean, changing yourself is really hard, and and people shouldn't take that lightly. I mean, it's yeah. Tanner's in the bathroom, so I'll say nice things about him. I mean, it's very difficult what he did. Right. I mean, what what kind of things did you do for Tanner through the process of getting off of uh, off of it? I uh, just kept telling him he can do it. Um, positive reinforcement. Um, you know, try not to say anything negative. Um, he he really kind of fell off the map for a little bit. Trying know? to not say something uh, negative, I think, is key there. Um, yeah, because I didn't I didn't want to like discourage him because I knew it was going to be hard. Right. Um, so I just try to remain positive and, you know, he disappeared for a while, but I, I knew that was going to happen. Um, and then how, how long did it take you to get a hold of me after that? I think it was soon after. Um, a couple of days. I, I withdrew, I, I went through the withdrawals for, I mean, like, after see heroin done, is it after your withdrawals, heroin and morphine, both morphine's a little bit longer lasting drug than heroin. Except if it's in your veins, but if if it's in if it if it goes intravenous, they're both very fast acting drugs. Yeah, you don't feel them for a long time; they exit quickly. And um, I mean, the withdrawals last. The worst of it's over by day four. Mm. You're still gonna feel depression. You're still gonna feel like shit. Didn't you come over to come over right afterwards? Like twenty first uh there's no way I, I wouldn't have been able to i i honestly can't remember the the first time i seen you afterwards um but i i remember after those four days were up af, I, after the day i was outside and something hit me in the chest i was bawling uncontrollably i couldn't say anything but there was a million thoughts going through my mind the day after that i remember waking up walking out of my room feeling fine mm. and uh my mom was just uh talking about how much it, it it just looked like life had been restored in my body you know I, i'm not trying to sound like color in your cheeks and right yeah right, right. where it, I, I wouldn't describe you as peppy but peppy for you maybe uh, i mean it is what it is yeah um no i I want to ask you about the after because, you know, you were at the party and you've been trying to get on for a while. And I, I personally didn't want you to come on because I didn't. And I know that the boss hog guys are of the exact same mind that we don't want this or the attention that this brings to do anything that might cause you any kind of harm. But after kind of talking to you a couple of times, uh, I think it was almost like a making amends like you wanted to come and make amends to the audience because it was really important to you uh to come and and do that and i think it was personally very embarrassing and you wanted people to know now now so you know like 
audiences are so fickle and turn over and pay so little attention. Right. Like yeah. people barely remember yeah. the co-host remember. that I had for 250 episodes, you know? So I, I wouldn't think too much about that, but uh, I feel that you are having a, you're struggling a little bit with being perceived as an addict or having been a drug user or you, you, I think sometimes you think uh, th that our circle is judging you, our, that your friends are judging you for what you went through, when in reality, we have nothing but empathy. Like, because... Uh, I mean, you're right. I mean, like you said, you thought it was too much edibles. I mean... I, I didn't know. I, 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 you've never touched, touched drugs in a lot. Right. Um, but over time, it essentially turned into a character. And... Well, yeah, it you, was a character have a, that I embraced. Yeah, you have a pothead voice. Right. And you smoked pot. And it was kind of like, oh, Tanner's eyes are red. What, did you get stung by bees? Do you need Benadryl? Like, yeah. Because you, you were, I thought you were just high on, on It's so, a funny joke, right, Ted? I mean, really. Pretty good. Pretty uh, good. Yeah. It's a bee. So it's every, a bee. Every, every time I would do a podcast, I would just go and get as loaded as possible and come on the air and have a good time. Yeah. Which is, which is honestly why we haven't had you back on because we didn't want to, we didn't. We don't want to do anything that causes you stress. Right. Oh, I was not under any stress. I can promise you that. Yeah, we know. I didn't right. feel a whole lot of anything. Yeah, yeah I didn't feel a whole lot <laughs> but itches and giggles. I, I just want you to know that nobody in our circle, and I've talked to pretty much all of it, all of, like nobody's judging you or thinks any less of you. They're all proud of you. There's no like negative consequences, really. I do think there are things that you did during that period that made some relationships a little tense and you have to work through that. It's just the reality of it. It's like, you know, I have been a complete rage. Like during my divorce, when you're in pain or you're in a, in a stressful situation, like you do things that you regret and you act certain ways that you, like I look back at certain points in 2015, 2016, and I am so embarrassed. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Like I'm just so embarrassed by some of my behavior and some of that period. Not, and like it just was grotesque and I, I really do like sometimes think about putting all of the shows before the last 50 for instance behind a paywall because like I don't want that version of myself out there well, I mean how do you how are you dealing with that a little bit people still talk about that episode to me to this day yeah and you know nobody wants to be seen going like this you know right F falling asleep on the microphone and you know talking a bunch of nonsense and you know, like you said, I I just got to make amends with this audience. Three quarters of you probably don't know who the hell I am. <laughs> but the quarter that do, I want you to know that I love you. Yeah. I, and, I, and you can do whatever you want. I have not taken that down because Tanner has said not to take that down. Don't take it down. Go so, watch it right now. I, I mean, I, so if anybody's like, why isn't he? That's why. Tanner wants it to, to stay up. And I, I honestly think at this point it's an important part of your story. Absolutely. Um, even though it's it was instrumental in, yeah. um, in the recovery of myself because then after that happened, see, I remember uh, uh, all of us went out to eat after that episode and they were going, they were, you know, they were just confused. They were like, how's, how's he getting home? I remember them discussing it. I can't tell you where we ate at. Stack pickle, I think. I mean, I I don't know. I yeah. just remember the conversation of how I was going to get home. And it was one of those, you know, you know, oh, I don't don't worry about me. I'll be all right. One of those deals. But truly, I had no business on the road. We genuinely thought. Well, you said I'll, I'm just going to sleep it off in my car. We thought you were drunk and high. And that you were going to take a nap in the stack pickle parking lot till you sobered up. See, I don't remember saying that. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's kind of what the discussion was. Um, yeah, so uh, it's just I, a I, fucked I'm, up story. Yeah, I'm proud of you, and I'm I'm proud of you for. <sighs> and I know that it's not been easy, and I know there's been moments where it's just kind of like, uh, man, <laughs> it, it it it's really it's got to be really hard for you. It's, how has it been on your family? Like, how do they feel about things now? Are they overprotective now? Oh, absolutely. Definitely. They, they totally are. And, um, you know, like, during this time, Boss Hog was just a baby. Yeah. It was just starting up. And I was on the very first episodes of Boss Hog. And if you go look at those episodes, you'll see the same thing. 
that you saw on whatever episode I was on here. Yeah. Maybe not as intense, but it was still there, you know. And um, I mean, now, now, you know, Newcastle is such a small town. It's it's almost it's almost like I just have to let everybody know that I'm okay because I think at that point nobody really expected me to be here very long. Yeah, and now I plan. I didn't expect on being here very long. So let me um, let me ask you this: like, kind of the maybe the motor. Like, you didn't. Did you have a messed up childhood? Did you grow up like? As far as I know, your parents are together. Like, you have good parents. Your dad, I saw him the other night. Like, he's a super nice guy. Yeah. Like, it doesn't seem to me that you have a drug problem because your family life was a mess and you had all these, like, I mean, did you, where did you start falling into drugs and why? Like, was it just you were 13 and fell into a bad crowd and everybody, was it literally the gateway? Like, well, I, how, did, how did you fall into it? I mean, it was your, it was your classic gateway story. It, it really was. I ate my first Vicodin. I was probably 14. Wow. 14, 13 years old. I drank my first beer when I was in second or third grade. What the and, um, How? I was actually staying the night at my friend's house, and his dad drank Coors Light, and he was a general manager at CVS, and he had a beer fridge that was always stocked to the brim with Coors Light. So, is it Tad your uncle? <laughs> <laughs> no, his, no. I don't call, drink coarse lights. <laughs> I'll, I'll call him out right now. His name is Ron McGinnis. That, that, that was the man's name. He was general manager of CVS. And, uh, it's not, he did nothing illegal having no, beer in he, his he, own home. He had, he had no idea. Right. Well, he caught us a few times and thought that it was my friend's older brother. And then, uh, you know, we got into the marijuana and... I'm not trying to make this Bummer fucking reefer madness bullshit, but if heroin was legal, I would have never got into it. I don't believe. Now, the pain pills, I mean, it was over prescription by the doctor. Hmm. If me medical marijuana was legal, I would have never fallen into this trap. I don't believe. I kind of feel like I fell into the pit that they dug for me. Hmm. Um, I mean, it's nobody's fault but my own. You know, it's not it's not their fault that they think that Vicodins are the 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 cure all for pain. So, yeah, it, it's just not. It's a band aid. And um, did you? And, and I don't know if you want to answer this, but did you buy all of your pills from the street, or did you go to doctors or pill mills, or I mean? What was your experience? Did you hear about doctors who overprescribe and they, there's just these clinics that will dole it out no matter what you want and they're making money off of it and they don't care who they kill. Uh, and we should note that Tanner is from a rural Indiana county and Tanner's town and county is like a lot of America, if not yeah. most of America. You know, so his experience, I think, is probably fairly common. Um, and in this small town, I mean, were there places like that? Oh yeah, definitely. There, there were the pill places. Um, was, uh, I don't know. If, don't don't, don't give specifics, <laughs> right? Uh, a certain doctor in Henry County, his medical license is suspended right now for uh, for uh, Medicaid fraud. Right. And that, he got away with some other stuff. That's all I'm gonna say about that. Okay. Otherwise, allegedly. Allegedly. This and is Tanner's opinion, not uh, mine or Tad's or Harry's. But allegedly, he's also the one that wouldn't write me the prescription for my anxiety medicine. But I know plenty of people that did get prescriptions from him that totally didn't need them at all. Mm. And uh, most, most of the drugs that I bought were on the street, most of them. Now, I kind of got creative. Okay. And... um. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, I, I'm very proud of you. But one thing I will say is okay. I never stole from anybody. I never fucked some old lady. Wait, what? I never did anything stupid. Ha Harry, for my what drugs. does that mean? 
Uh, you can ask Kyle. He didn't Kyle, sell his Kyle, body. Kyle will attest. I did not sell my <laughs> body right. for drugs. Kyle, is there a high demand for male prostitution in the elderly female community <laughs> that I'm not aware of? <laughs> oh, hell yeah. Trina. All that Viagra is going to go somewhere. I don't know. You'd have to ask Tanner. <laughs> Tad, are you a secret male <laughs> escort to the blue, the blue crown? <laughs> oh, you know what? If your pubes ain't blue, I ain't playing. Is that your mono? <laughs> Remember, uh, oh, what was her name? Anna Nicole Smith? Yes. Yeah, I'm... You're the reverse technical Western. <laughs> All right. Well, again, the phone lines are open at 317-795-0325. So if you want to weigh in on anything, it has to be germane to the topic. Don't call in about just random BS, but uh, the phone lines are open. Uh, I am very proud of you, Tanner. I'm very proud of you Thank for you. maintaining your sobriety. Absolutely. I know how incredibly difficult that is. And uh, I'm, I'm proud of you for coming on and telling your story and hope that that helps somebody else. And Kyle, I hope it does too. Yeah. And, and one what, what thing, go ahead, give your final statement. Final statement, you know, halfway has to do with me. I've, like I said, I've done every drug. Uh, and I will say that if you have a kid and you're thinking about putting them on Adderall, please do not do that. Why? I've taken Adderall and I've taken methamphetamine. I was more twacked out on Adderall than I ever was on the meth. Hmm. When I did meth, I felt dirty, I felt disgusting, and I couldn't wait for it to wear off. Hmm. Adderall was euphoric. It was uplifting. It it was a it was a wonder drug, you know. Hmm. And it, it's just it's the same thing. I mean it, it it feels almost identical. Yeah. And I know they say, well, some kids with ADD feel it this way. No, they get they get used to the feeling. It's like um, if I was to take, um, you know, twenty milligrams of caffeine a day. After six months, I probably wouldn't feel a difference taking the twenty milligrams of caffeine compared to none. And um, I don't think there's a huge difference between right. Um, Adderall and methamphetamine they they when when I took them they acted the same only Adderall felt a little bit cleaner maybe, mm. per se you know uh Kyle any tips for uh people out there who may have a loved one who is going through what Tanner went through and they just don't know what to do you just gotta constantly be, well I don't want to say constantly but you just gotta be there you know you you can't you know shun them away just because you disagree with what they're doing i mean that's that's the time when you need to be there most you know when they're yeah. fucking up and they're doing the shit they ain't supposed to um because i feel like when that happens and people get like that and the people that they love and care for their family or whatever they 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 distance themselves from them it it sends them over you know and then they just keep going. Or they I, isolation or they, is a very dangerous yeah, thing. Isolation is a bad place to be, especially when you're addicted to drugs. Uh, so, uh, just uh, be there for them, you know? Yeah. Positive reinforcement. Isolation, I think, is uh, a huge problem across the board in a lot of the things that we're talking about. Uh, I, You know, you look at what, what we've seen over the past few days uh, – it's a very complex problem. I think all libertarians, you know, sort of hate these instances because it's, uh, it's kind of turned into just sort of a ghoulish uh, dunking by the, the pro-gun confiscation crowd. Um, you know, I, I had a discussion about guns with a family member on Friday, and they're like, ah, it's not about gun confiscation. I'm like, Every other major country has done that. That's what everybody, when you really sit down and get them honest, that's what they want. Like every, you know, and the reality is that in a, in a country where there's three guns for every uh, person, well, like 25% of the world's guns or something. I don't know. It's some, well, you it's, may, I don't. I lost all mine in the boating act. Right. <laughs> uh, it, it's just turned into, like I even saw one liberal friend today saying mental illness is the new thought and thoughts and prayers and i just think that is incredibly dangerous and and, and horrible like i thought that was a joke he, i was like is no that serious no he's he's dead that? serious and you're taking a very complex sociological problem and you're trying to demagogue to 
when when your side when in reality gun confiscation isn't going to work um it's never going to happen and, and so there's just a lot of dangerous strains of thought around this stuff now and i think we're all ir acting completely irresponsibly and grotesquely in a lot of ways and i personally hate it i hate these these instances and you know everybody the the old days of you know let's wait a couple days let people grieve let's get through this like i mean this one hit me hard like i was doing a podcast with alan frank uh al jackson frank caliendo try to be serious that's going to be on uh, that'll be released on Thursday. So the same day that this is out where we talk about gun control. And then I did, uh, the following week, there'll be another episode. And, you know, we had a very thoughtful conversation about gun control with, you know, Al obviously doesn't agree with me and I don't agree with Al, but we had a long, decent conversation about this. And I think that you can do that. But as I'm sitting there, I see the Dayton shooter had killed his sister. And like, I just wanted to start crying. Like, and then the next day you read the story about the, the parents, the mother that shielded her two month old, and then the dad that jumped on top of the mother and they both die. Like it's, it's incredibly upsetting and it's an incredibly tragic story. And I just find all of it to be incredibly, uh, I mean, there's just no other word than coolish. Uh, and, and I think a lot of people on the anti-gun side are really acting in a way that it's going to end up be it's going to end up hurting their cause because people who I, I am not a gun owner. I've only fired a gun once with Jason Doolittle and Harry. Uh, I, I used to be for gun control. Like a lot of people didn't know this, but when the libertarian party hired me in 2008, I was very much for gun control. I'm not, um, I, I'm not somebody who is like attending the NRA convention by any means, uh, but they're uh, not pro gun or not. <laughs> right yeah i'm not i'm not one of those guys but like you really turned me off when you start saying mental illness is the new thoughts and prayers and you're going to just propagandize an important core piece of the solution right because you want to just confiscate guns like you're you're going i i just wrote this is the dumbest thing i've ever seen and he's like well that's very thoughtful i go it's more thoughtful than anything you just wrote because it's just that, that, that's a really fucked up place to take this. But let me give some details on exactly what happened. So th this is the other thing. None of us are talking, like both of these shootings, Tad, within the first 24 hours, oh, it's white, it's a right. Well, we had three. It, it, we had, well, there's four, actually. Uh, yeah. We had the garlic shooting, and then there was one in yeah. Oregon. The, the garlic festival. There was also, <laughs> nobody, it's like, there, wasn't there one in Chicago, too, that was like, it was. Well, like, Chicago yeah, had like, like 40. In Chicago. They had like 40 sh people shot. But I think like there was one incident where it was like night. several six people six died in one shooting. Yeah, it was. Yeah, but it, that was like a drive-by. That's just a show. Yeah, that's a Wednesday for Chicago. That's like callous to it, but that's just Chicago. No, yeah. I, I mean, there was so much. Over the weekend. But yeah, and, and Al Jackson. Over the past two weeks. And Al Jackson made a great point. He goes, you know, when people say, but Chicago, it's sort of a dog whistle to say, get your own community in order before you start criticizing ours. And that's not how I view it. I view it as, uh, you know, A, why doesn't the media cover Chicago anymore? If you're going to propagandize or essentially or really like elevate these shootings, there's just no doubt that when you look at how the media covers this stuff, El Paso got the majority of the coverage mm -hmm. because he fit within a certain narrative that politically was convenient mm -hmm. uh, that went against Donald Trump. And even in the manifesto, it wasn't pro-Trump. Yeah, uh, I read the manifesto. I was like, what the hell? Like, what <laughs> is it? <laughs> he, he's a Yang gang. I mean, yeah, really, I mean, if you want to get down to it. Correct. Uh, and, but they don't cover Chicago. And I can't help but think that that's because those are black people. And I, I think that there's it, a lot of things. That, that think that, story. I think yeah. that, yeah. And I think there's a lot of different, different reasons why, but it's also, I, I don't think that, uh, I don't know. I just think it's, it's not, it's not that people get outraged over the killing anymore. It's about who did it and what, and who, like, like right, what, yeah. poli what it's politics how, they have. It's how can I use it. the death of people for my own political? How can I project that to win political points? If you're doing that on any side, if you're trying to like right now score points for pro guns, like quit being a scumbag. Like I, I don't, I just look at all this stuff and I go, I understand the need to, support our rights and to explain why our rights are important but like don't look at this as some sort of like 
game. Like, I don't, I just think it's, ugh. Harry, you're trying to jump in. What, what do you think? Because it's not like the loss of the loss of life is tragic, whether it happened in Chicago, Baltimore, Indianapolis, Gary, mm-hmm. uh, the de- and I just hate that they, they use the death tolls. They're like, look how look look what happened. I'm like, well, that is a Saturday afternoon in Chicago. That is a long weekend here in Indianapolis. That is just ten seconds of Baltimore, you know, or being in the wrong spot in Florida, you know, like. Stop producing, stop giving these numbers out. These, you know, those numbers will you really, if anyone has really start stop and look at the numbers, you know, they can look through all the, the, the propaganda BS to it. Do, Harry, do you think that there's any element of, do you think the fact that when mass shootings happen in the black community and they're not covered, but then when it happens in a white community, it gets a lot of press? Do you think that that is racially motivated? Like, is there an element of racism in that on the press's part? It, I don't know if it's like I don't want to attribute it to racism, but I I I will attribute it to just the simple fact that majority of these areas that I did cover or t- these towns I talk about are you know it doesn't fit their narrative of their like gun con- gun control of anyone's gun control co- confiscation method and that their person is also mayor and their reps are also but uh, ergo those people's lives are worth less in the in the eyes of the media yeah I mean that's how I look at it yeah because well. Those, those lies aren't going to get clicks. Yeah. Those, those aren't going to get clicks. No I'm wondering how many of them were on um, SSRIs or... Uh, mean the mass shooters? Yeah, the mass shooters. How many of them were on SSRI medications or amphetamines? I would say, I would say over 50%. That's just a guess. But, And by the way, I love how I'm the only one with a mic switch here except for Spangle. Hey, there's one here. Harry, you can turn yours off kind of permanently. <laughs> Harry, I had to take Harry's away because he wouldn't forget to turn his mic back on. So oh, okay. he wasn't responsible. With <laughs> well, it's it. totally. Um, all right. So let me give some details of the shooting. So we actually know kind of what's going on, what we're talking about. Again, if you want to jump in here, phone number is 317-795-0325. You can call in uh, and uh, weigh in on the conversation. Um. As of writing this, 22 people were killed and dozens more were injured on Saturday, August 3rd in a mass shooting at El Paso, Texas in a Walmart. Now, this is the seventh deadliest mass shooting in the United States. And El Paso Police Chief Gref Allen said the first 911 call came in at 10.39 a.m. local time and that emergency responders were on the scene uh, six minutes later, 10.45 a.m. The shooting began in the parking lot outside the Walmart, according to an eyewitness who said she heard gunshots as she drove through the parking lot with her mother. The wounded in the mass shooting ranged from two years old to 82, according to two authorities. The suspect is a 21-year-old male from Allen, Texas. Uh, We don't give their names. He was taken into custody without incident. Investigators believe that the suspect is the same person who allegedly posted a four-page racist anti-immigrant document on the website 8chan before launching the attack. The document was reportedly posted online less than an hour before the attack. The document decried what the author believed was an ongoing invasion of Texas by Hispanic people and what the author foresaw as the impending destruction of America. It suggested that the planned attack would give immigrants an additional incentive to return to their countries of origin. Now, There is no other name for that besides terrorism. He was trying to inflict terror into a community of people so that they wouldn't take an action by using violence. There is absolutely no doubt that this person is a terrorist. I mean, does anybody want to disagree that this was a terrorist attack based on white supremacy? Okay. Uh, The author indicated he did not consider himself a white supremacist, though. The document lambasted, quote, race mixers and said the U.S. should be split into territories based on race. The document was critical of Republicans and also accused Democrats of using immigrants to engineer a nationwide political coup. The suspect wrote on LinkedIn in high school, I'm not really motivated to do anything more than what's necessary to get by. Working in general sucks, but I guess a career in software development suits me well. I spend eight hours a day on the computer, so that counts towards technology experience, I guess. Uh, Two law enforcement officials told ABC News that the suspect told investigators that he wanted to shoot as many Mexicans as possible. 
The, the Walmart is located at Cielo Vista Mall, one of the city's most popular malls, particularly among Mexican tourists who cross the U.S. border to shop there before returning to Mexico. Uh, at least three Mexican nationals were killed in the attack, Mexican President Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador said. Um, he was forthcoming with information. He basically didn't hold anything back, El Paso Police Chief Greg Allen said during a Sunday news conference. Quote, you have to see it for yourself. He said of the crime scene, when I first got into the ch this job, I never knew there was an odor to blood, but there is. And you firsthand see that. As far as my description of it, horrific would be undeserving as far as what the crime scene looks like. Officials say that an assault rifle similar to an AK-47 was secured at the scene. John Bash, the U.S. attorney for the Western District of Texas, said that the federal authorities are investigating the incident as an act of domestic terrorism and will consider federal hate crime charges and potentially seek the death penalty. Investigating the incident as an act of domestic terrorism means the suspect was intent on, quote, coercing and intimidating a civilian population. On Monday, law enforcement officials said that the suspect cased the Walmart going inside on Saturday without any weapons, apparently to size up the clientele inside the store, which is about five miles from the border. The suspect then exited the store and armed himself. He returned wearing protective earmuffs, safety glasses, and a rifle, according to video surveillance, surveillance, you know, I can't say that word, of him inside the store. In response to the attack, Donald Trump said on Sunday, hate has no place in our country and we're going to take care of it. Trump later tweeted, we can, quote, we cannot let those killed in El Paso, Texas, and Dayton, Ohio die in vain. Likewise, those so seriously wounded, we can never forget them and those many who came before them. Republicans and Democrats must come together and get strong background checks, perhaps marrying this legislation with desperately needed immigration reform. We must have something good, if not great, come out of these two tragic events. So, uh, you know, I... All right, let's start with 8 Chan. Um, because I think there is within this audience, there's probably a lot more people who are, are thinking, we talk a lot about uh, free speech on this program. We talk a lot about uh, the crackdown on a lot of this stuff. We talk a lot about the term white supremacist or racist being used as a pretext to demonetize people like Alex Jones and, and, and conspiracy theorists across the board and, and take them off. Uh, I have not, I have eight chan bookmarked i have visited probably five times in my life i don't make a habit of going to it um i know that it was started by uh, a guy with disabilities who basically uh what, do you know the story do either i believe Harry? they left uh hot wheels left 4chan right <laughs> because it was they were cracking down too much on freedom of speech and then he started uh eight chan and I don't know. He ended up selling it to some other guy. But, but what's wrong? With, what's wrong with free speech? Well, there's nothing wrong with free speech. I mean, if that dude, I don't care what he believed, but you know, as fucked up as or as screwed up as what happened, a lot of a lot of black people have the same views. Look, look at Marcus Garvey. Marcus Garvey thought that all black people should move well, back but to Africa. He, I mean, Marcus Garvey didn't take an AK-47 and Absolutely. commit the seventh he, he, That's it's, it's a totally different story, but yeah. they had the same idea. Only one didn't shoot up a Walmart. There, there's right. to, well, that's there's the also, difference there. There's also, uh, Marcus Garvey was 100 years ago. Let's just, let's, let's say, let's get back to, to what we're talking. I mean, 8chan has been also a target for the longest time. When those people did finally leave 4chan and also go to 8chan, it's, a lot of that exodus happened in around the uh, couple of years was when the first great meme worm started started, which was the uh, which was Gamergate. Yep, it was Gamer back to Gamergate. Shocking, we're back here again. You know, yeah, Gamergate was, the, was uh, uh, a large fight in the gamer community about uh, misogyny and uh, women having a place in video games. No, no. No. That was not what a gamer. Gamergate was was bit with the original fake news fighters. This is why they were noticing fake news when Gamers Trump was are the most opposed race. Gamergate was about ethics in journalism yep. because they were ga gamers were rising up against their journalist journalism class, <laughs> going for the medium that they you know that they enjoyed, and they watched that they uh, that they were all working together 
and giving them a you know fake news and giving them crappy games and you basically them- intersectional oh. politics was creeping into re- it's kind of like no, to make- no it wasn't even that it was, it was just like bad games and yeah. that people were giving I'm trying reviews. to get I'm trying to give a one sentence soundbite to the people who really don't care about Gamergate well, <laughs> Gamergate's important because it gave you Donald Trump it's the most oppressive <laughs> yeah. To be perfectly honest, the meme warriors that fought in Gamergate, right? They came and fought for also for Donald Trump because they also saw the fake news go after him. Yeah, I mean, Harry, you called me fake news one time. Really? You're fake news. You're fake news. It's been, it's been a couple <laughs> years ago, but you called me fake news. All right, so eight chan was eight chan basically the toxic elements of four chan left started eight chan. And uh, because mods were cracking down on four chan, and I want to consider no. no. No, they, they just, just split. Right. Out of, Describe like, 8chan to me, please. 8chan right. is just like 4chan. It's just people who, it's just an image. A website. Board. Yeah, just a board. Just a board where people post stuff anonymously. That's it. That's it. Attaching morals to that, that's nah, all on you, bro. Uh, <laughs> anyone can post on it they really right. what does that but mean? the thing yeah. is but the, but the people who left like were fortunate was because they were back the, back in Gamergate what you kept thinking of that is that this discussion they were trying to find a place to discuss what was going on and they needed to do it anonymously because everyone else would get destroyed yeah. they were trying to do it in um, uh, on 4chan well they got blocked there shut down right and they moved over to 8chan yeah Dennis makes a good but didn't it start when a woman an accusation that a woman was sleeping with a guy to get a good game review. It wasn't just a guy. It was like five guys. Okay. Was this you, Tad Wester? <laughs> yes. Lisa, no. I'm calling you out. <laughs> what? <laughs> so. That may have been the catalyst, but it wasn't like the real start of Gamergate. Gamergate was a lot deeper than just one person. and one person. It was the, just then one person sleeping with five, uh, five guys for a good yeah. game review. It was the ethics of it, the, the whole spiral of it. It couldn't have been with just one, one person. It was just the whole ethics of the whole situation. Right. So they, they start 8chan as an anonymous place to kind of discuss a lot of this stuff. And it turns into a random board about a variety of subjects. And now, whenever a mass shooting happens, isn't Eight Chan sort of the, where all of the pictures spawn of here's here's like this one? The guy was wearing cargo pants when he walked in the Walmart. Here's the the arrest shot, and he's not wearing cargo pants. That that sort of stuff. That I mean, it isn't Eight Chan. I I think it's fair to say that Eight Chan is where a lot of these guys who are on the on the fringes and like white supremacists i mean aren't they all having conversations on 4chan no, they're all having conversations on facebook they're on twitter and everything else too i mean right. it's, it's not just discord, web, discord. Not i've never even heard of they it. use cars too <laughs> the, the idea that 8chan is somehow worse than what goes on on twitter or 4chan or any other website is i mean there's mods to 8chan the the post that was originally posted for this manifesto was a screenshot from what I saw. It was a PDF that somebody had tried to upload into uh, to 8chan. And then all the comments on there were like, all right, FBI. And then a bunch of words I'm not going to use, but like, you're not going to do it or this is bullshit. And it was taken down, I think, within 10 minutes of being posted. Is it, a bunch, of, is it a bunch of guys who are just shit talking and then yeah, it's then point yeah, just, it's, it's of It's literally them. anonymous. It's literally anonymous, whatever. Right. You, you'll have a post about I don't know, whatever happens, whatever big happens and not even just shootings or whatever, but mm-hmm. all right, say a space shuttle blows up. All right, there's going to be a thread on, all right, what's everybody know about what's going on with this? All news. Right. They'll get, I mean, that would probably be hilarious. Sort of like with 4chan when the, when the Boston it, bombing happened. And yeah, all, 4, I mean, it's 4chan tried to track the guy down. They missed, like they got the In the, the Chan's own words, himself. it's, you know, weaponized autism, basically, yeah. well, <laughs> is it, what it is. It's like, yeah. If you want a, if you want a more deep full deep dive into 4chan and the and trolling culture we did one with James Neese about 3 4 months ago that's right. a great episode yeah it's really good I mean, it's just random it's anybody it's anonymous so correct no there's it's pretty much the you're going to get what people think i mean correct. you want to call that racist or whether they're joking you don't i mean <laughs> well, there's Facebook a lot of racial terms one at a time. Used, but... One at a time, Tanner. <laughs> but it's I mean yeah, I, shut up, Tad. Whether someone's actually a racist or not, I don't who knows. I don't All right, go ahead. You don't Aaron. even know who they are. Yeah. <laughs> what you're saying is government agents. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, yeah. Majority of the time there's probably thirty percent government agents on it. Tad is not wrong. He's probably yeah, government agents. Been a, uh, yeah. Been a honeypot for well Correct. all the chains are. I mean right. what does honeypot mean? Basically FBI agents, any type of 
any type of agent. Okay. Uh, Where are they? Training government. Training. Posting stuff online, replying to stuff, trying to get people in. Like, like Easy a targets. honeypot. Have you ever seen Trump's Facebook? No. You, you, you click on the comments and it's like, oh, thank you, President Trump. I love you so much. And thank you for all you do for our country. Right. With like eight hearts. You know that's a fucking bomb. Well, the, <laughs> no, I think that's Deborah at church. Yeah. But, <laughs> and, that is the boomer that uh, I saw wearing it, the Trump hat. It's like, fair sure, today. Surely not. Like, surely not that many people. But you're right. I mean, I was playing poker last night. I was, well, for we were, we were playing for no money. But I was playing poker last night, and this guy was like, you know what? I'm proud of Trump. And he's doing a great job. And I'm like, man, that is the same dude that I see comments yeah. on that. Yeah, no, they exist, yeah. Saying I'm proud of you for the first time. I'm happy to be. No, I think, I think so the guys that I know that go on 8chan or 4chan, uh, specifically 8chan, Tad, they're the guys that we were hanging out with a lot in 2016, 2015. They were the guys who were like, ah, I think free speech is important. So if I want to make this anti-Semitic joke, it's just because I'm joking. And, well, and then yeah. by 2017, it's like, oh, you're in a white nationalist group. OK, because you're not kidding anymore. It seems like a lot of those. <laughs> it seems like a lot of those guys uh, where they just start just kidding. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, why do you uh, actually hate Jews? Yeah. And you're also talking. Oh, that's really loud. And you're you're also talking about only one small part of the website, the political okay. side. There's there's multiple boards on. So I mean, not, you could talk about television. There's all kinds of shit. I, mean, I read on CNN it's, that it's just a the oh. den of. <laughs> oh, it is. It oh, it is. CNN. It's exactly. But it's just yeah. It, it's you don't understand the culture or what it what it is. I mean. So was I, it, is it fair to say that a lot of the journalists who are covering HN and kind of like you listen to these New York Times podcasts? They have no idea like, what they're talking about. I think I sent a uh, – Zero. What it was. I sent an article from somewhere that a uh, – it may have been ABC know. News or somebody did a uh, – they were going through the uh, – Oh, yes. They are going through the, that. Oh, what, the abbreviations of <laughs> yes. certain things and what they <laughs> thought they meant. It, it's it, absolutely it, hilarious. It was hilarious. And they, those weren't even like – those were like normal – Abbreviate like if S I if I showed you an F uh, those abbreviations you'd know what they're those are just like short S J W yeah S J like socialist Jews are running the world yeah, so I don't know how they I turn. can't remember what it was uh, the internet <laughs> like spotted Jew did, did, I can't remember did what it they was. it no oh, yeah. it, was a, it was a new it was a legit news it was a big thing and, all right here, I don't know. Here, here we go everybody be quiet no it wasn't for me I just saw it online <laughs> no here I'll play it everyone quiet. <laughs> Yeah, I found, I posted it. Was it ABC? Who was it? So they literally can MSNBC. Uh, it's MSNBC. Yeah, you. So you'll have to. Let me turn this up. So they literally cannot be more. Oh, that's the guy talking. I thought I was like I was about to yell at Harry. I thought it was Harry. Yeah. <laughs> right. I was like, is that Harry? So they have on the screen milk and bacon and okay signs in graphics, uh, and it says right. Frog Pult uses secret code of racist and homophobic words. So they literally symbols. cannot be more for wrong instance, about all of this. Snowflake is code for black person. Oh. SJW <laughs> is code for stingy Jew. It is? The term cuck, a derogatory for men who love obese women. Uh. And trap, which means punk girl, I want to rape. The black person. <laughs> Had you not heard that, Harry? No, I did not hear that. That's hilarious. <laughs> All right, let me play that one more time. Yeah, that tra they that have trap one got me. Why? So literally cannot be more for wrong instance, about all of this. Snowflake is code for black person. Oh. SJW is code for stingy Jew. It is? A derogatory for men who love obese women. Wow. And trap, which means, fuck girl, I want to rape. <laughs> Where did they come up? With Dude, they did not get one of those right. That's almost yeah. like someone on 4chan was trolling them, like when they, you know, like, it, it, like gave them those definitions. That's sort of what the 4chan, 8chan thing is like milk. Like milk is a symbol for white supremacy. The OK sign is. Oh, yeah. That, the, whole, the whole OK thing came out of let's try and get people to take something that was a normal, just something normal and turn it into racist. See, because mm -hmm. it was literally, remember. The, the clown world thing that came out, how Twitter started banning all the clown memes. Explain that. Because they basically, somebody on 4chan was like, 
this is literally a clown world we're living in with the normies. The yeah. me news media will pick up this stuff and they just they'll run with it. They think that an OK symbol is actually white power right they're trolling them right? and they're, they're literally yeah. just trolling they're like well let's see what the craziest shit that we can do to get these people and, and pick them up and they literally started banning clown <laughs> memes because right. hong, kong, hong kong hong kong was <laughs> white supremacy yeah that's okay but how many people are using the okay symbol because they're trolling and how many people are like ah this is the hot new racist thing that i can do i don't know i i, I don't know because well, everything's racist mean, now so i don't a lot. like the, you see the clowns well clowns they would take old pictures of like People from the 90s, you know, yeah. doing okay. So, yeah. One of them was Joe Rogan. They took Joe Rogan, and he, like, retweeted it because he had a headshot where he was giving an okay. <laughs> back when he had a headshot. And he was like, oh, shit, I hope the internet don't find this. They're going to think I'm a racist now. <laughs> and it's just like, what? Like, it's just – it just you now everything's gone nuts, and it's outrage culture, basically. It, if you want is. to find that video of uh, the, the MSNBC piece, uh, check it out in the videos tab on We Are Libertarians' Facebook page. Harry, do you got anything you want to jump in here with? That's just that's the other thing with it. Like it's that whole they're blaming 8chan for all this different stuff when people do it on every other site, Discord, Facebook. This is just what this is just how the internet is. Like this is just a collection of just chat rooms which is easy to be found. You know, eventually sites like this are all you know, tons of sites like this exist that you can only access using Tor. So it's like but this is one they can find. And this is one that someone posted something to that we can try to attribute to this person, but you know, sorry, that's all I got with that. I mean, it was just, he, this the latest man. If they were they were trying to take down uh, eight chan back when the New Zealand thing happened. Correct. He, I mean, well, they were trying. He, he live streamed to Facebook. You know, right, like right. What the original video was right. I mean, it was the Facebook. Yeah, yeah. Why yeah. people wouldn't at least you know? But they want to go after the platform because they don't. They don't. They don't understand it. I guess I don't. Yeah, it's all. I think. I think more it had to do with them. Uh, because uh oh what, what's it called the q the q, q conspiracy is also on you yeah. right so my favorite's the navy seal and there were there had been a lot of the, the past month or two there had been a lot of news about like 8chan and all these a lot of exposés i guess well they're the know. new yeah you know well, they're the boogeyman that, but but here's the thing there's a lot of uh red meat there <laughs> like that's oh yeah that's the especially if you don't understand it like right. i mean what what are so that's the place that uh a uh, guy who will go and kill all these people because they're of uh, what he considers a lesser race, he feels comfortable posting that manifesto there. Well, but He's it, showing off for his boys. But it, 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 but what you're failed to, there's shit posted there all the time and it all gets taken down. There's actual but, mods. It gets taken down. When you, when you guys were in school, was there a Tart Army? <laughs> Oh my God. I'm, I'm being, I'm being, I'm, I'm, I'm not Christ. joking, dude. What? I don't even know if I should ask for more information, but I'm going to. Go you, ahead, you Tana. know exactly what I'm talking about. Harry, hey, hold on, sorry. Harry, Harry, we're off the rail. Harry, should I ask for more information? No. All no. right, we're gonna move on. Harry, shut up. You know what exactly? <laughs> they wear camouflage, and you know they're the exact type that you would suspect. Yeah, you mean the the guy, the school shooter type. Yes. Yeah. And they wear camouflage. In the winter, they wear winter camouflage. Well, when I was in school, I started wearing the ATA patch, the anti tart Army Alliance patch. So but you were like the Antifa of your school. Except we had the NPA and the ATA, the Normal People's Alliance and the anti tart Army. All right, shut up. I'm just being honest. It, Kyle, that's what, a real Kyle, story. I have no oh. idea what he's talking about. <laughs> he's lying. Do you, are you lying because you oh, don't want no, to be associated? No, I, I, am I being bamboozled I, here? See, we didn't go to school together. Okay. So. He's lying. Look at him. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever have the tarred army at your Did school? Did you ever have, like, the tarred <laughs> army? Don't word. slow it down more, Tanner. <laughs> <laughs> Every school's got that group of people that wears camouflage, Oh yeah, and for us it was like this. for us it was black. They wore black eyeliner. They they loved Dylan Klebold and the, that's the, an emo the, phase. The, yeah, yeah, like that's what it was in my school. They I mean, listened he's to talking more. No, about, we got this motherfucker got caught with an RPG. He's he talking. He's talking about the grenade. guy. He's literally Here. talking about the group of people that live out in the woods, and then the FBI Here. infiltrates. Let, them. let me find. He's one. talking about like militia type. I'm yeah, talking yeah, I think about talking somebody about that. that got busted with a grenade at school. Uh, his name was Derek Cook. He got stung by the 
on the dick by a B. Here, here's his profile. Well, now that's why he's turned the, to terrorism. There, there's he's... his profile picture, him holding an RPG. Oh, yeah. That's real. Caution, angry gamer. Angry gamer. <laughs> I, I think... Anytime someone holds an RPG, you look for that yellow, look for that yellow stripe. See that yellow stripe on it? Yeah. Yep, that means it's a training, uh, training. There, there is no yellow stripe on it. It's just a caution, angry game. The fucking weirdo is what he is. All right, subscribe so, to Pootie Pie. So let me let me transition into the Dayton shooting. So the Dayton shooting kind of ties into exactly what Tanner's talking about in a weird way. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, so just after one a.m. on Sunday, August fourth, a gunman opened fire in a popular part of Dayton, Ohio, killing nine people and injuring fourteen. The suspect, a 24-year-old Ohio man, traveled to the Oregon district of Dayton with his sister and another companion, eventually parting ways. At 1.05 a.m., the suspect, wearing body armor and ear protection and carrying a two, uh, 223 caliber rifle with a 100-round magazine, moved through an alley and began firing shots. The weapon was purchased legally online from Texas and shipped to a gun store in the Dayton area. Authorities added that the gun was modified with a pistol brace. Uh, Harry, what does that mean? It's a pistol brace? The pistol, he had a, a pistol uh, grip on uh, it. No, no, no. Sure. The, uh, instead of having a stock, he had the uh, arm support. Okay. Which, it's not a, it's oh. completely legal to my knowledge. It depend, well, the ATF, I don't know if they're listening. I, I'll probably fuck this up. But I'm just I believe if the, uh, there's a whole, I don't know. You have to, it depends on what length the barrel is, I believe. Mm. Good answer, Ty Lester. And, if it's a certain length, you, well, however you buy it, it, it has to be bought. It can be classified as a pistol or an ah. assault rifle, depending on what stock is on it and the length of the barrel. So I, this could have been a short mm. barrel rifle. If I'm okay, not so pi oh, pistol brace is the brace. The, yeah, it's the brace. Oh, back, yeah. The, sorry, I was yeah. like, brace. You kind of keep it steady because it's the arm brace. Yeah. Like they sell on like a SIG, I guess, MPX or okay. whatever. So the suspect yeah. shot and killed one person in the alley before moving out to the street where he shot and killed eight more, including his sister. Dayton Police Chief Richard Beale said officers were already in the area and responded immediately. Within about 30 seconds from the start of the shooting, police had located and killed the suspect outside a local sports bar about 100 feet where the shooting began. Uh, so, yeah. Did you I watch guess, the security cam I, I didn't, but I guess he, like, six cops moved in right away. It was more than, well, I don't know. There was probably six on the camera, but it was, it would be, like, downtown on, uh, yeah. uh, this is like this a is bar a, district, and yeah. there, there's cops everywhere in this. I was like, what is, is this shooting already happened or what? And you see the guy, I, you don't see him shooting anybody, but you see him approach the, he didn't even get into the bar. Had he gone into the bar, Had, it would have been really bad. Yeah. Yeah, and he approaches the bar and he just gets blasted with a shotgun from. And there's Dang. you see all these cops from the security camera. I, there had to be six at least, all guns drawn, rushing in. Like they, they went right to it. They stopped it. So I asked my friend Alina, who's been on the program, and she Quick. said that's where she goes to party downtown. Like that's where they. She she's like I wasn't there that night. Uh, the comedy club that I you know have a lot of friends that work at is right. Like he was in there. Right, right next. That's to what it. it looked like. I mean, it yeah. literally looked like it was the bar district downtown Indy, but just with all the cops exactly. And, and so running. there were a lot of people. There were a lot of cops, and I guess they came in and just unloaded. But it, had he gone in that bar, it would have been really bad. Uh, so yeah. authorities are unsure if the victim meant to kill his sister, twenty-two-year-old student at Wright State University. The murder of a sister is called a sororicide, and it isn't a well-studied phenomenon in the United States. A 2013 FBI study of 160 mass shootings between 2000 and 2013 found that in nine cases, shooters killed relatives before going into a public place to continue firing. A 1981 study of honor killings in the Middle East concluded that in about one-third of instances, brothers killed sisters. Now, four classmates say the suspect had a kill list and a rape list. The Associated Press. Well, if you're going to have one, you might as well have the other, right? Did I tell you about the time I was number one on somebody's kill list in high school? Hold that thought. Was it the Tart Alliance? <laughs> right. Dude, it was the, the Tart Army. He was a captain in the, in the Tart Army. All right. Yeah. All right. Well, hold, hold on to that thought, please. The Associated Press reported that classmates said he was suspended in high school for compiling a hit list. Nobody disbelieves you. It's just not the appropriate place for you to insert that particular story. <laughs> well, I'm the, sorry. In the middle of serious. <laughs> right. We're in a war, man. Serious I've face. Got, I've got PTSD. The, the Associated Press reported that classmates said he was suspended in high. The, I, I'm trying to get through this, and Kyle just can't stop laughing. He's just rolling his <laughs> uh, he's shaking his head. Uh, 
so he was suspended in high school for the hit list uh, of those he wanted to kill and a rape list of girls he wanted to sexually assault. The discovery <laughs> of the hit list. Are you okay over there? All right, just keep your mic off. What? The discovery of the hit list, Beavis over here, I can't, can't get through. Uh, the discovery of the hit list in early 2012 sparked a police investigation. A roughly one third of school students skipped out of school out of fear, uh, according to an article. So basically his high school, they, there was a third after it kind of became known in 2012, they just didn't go to school because of this kid. Uh, suspect appeared to tweet extreme left views and abiding interest in violence. A Twitter account that appears to belong to the suspect retweeted extreme left wing and anti police post as well as tweeting as tweet supporting Antifa. The Twitter account liked several tweets about the shooting in El Paso and retweeted messages supporting Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren. Hmm. There were also several posts condemning police and supporting Antifa protesters. Uh, so, you know, let me see if I can find real quick this article uh, because it kind of really gives you an insight into the brain of this particular person uh, who seemed just incredibly disturbed. This is from Vice. Oh, God. I know. Exclusive. Dayton Shooter was in a, quote, porno grind band that released songs about raping and killing women. Oh, I shared that with you, didn't I? Uh, not this article, but this is a pretty good article. So over the... So the name of his band cracked me up. He was deeply involved in the misogynic male dominated gore, dominated gore grind or porno grind extreme metal music scene. And it has a regional following in the Midwest and is known for sexually violent death obsessed lyrics and dehumanizing imagery depicting women. Now <laughs> in other news, ne James niece just sold his drum set. <laughs> <laughs> He's looking for elite singers. <laughs> That was a solid joke. <laughs> that was pretty good. Um, I'm just going to need you to mute your mic, Tanner. Just right. keep it off. Don't talk through. He'll be giggling. Through Let these. me just get through this because I'm trying to be serious. This is a serious subject and you can't ha handle this. Uh, so, yeah, here's the thing. Like, sometimes I feel like we're in a Monty Python sketch, Tad, and the foot is about to just, I'm waiting for the foot to come squash me because this is one of those times where I'm going, this is serious news. Oh, this is real life. I mean, this is this real is, life. Yeah, this is real life is stranger than fiction. So over the past 24, uh, over the past year, the 24 year old shooter occasionally performed live vocals in the band Menstrual Munchies, which released albums titled Six Ways of Female Butchery and Preteen Daughter Pussy Slaughter. With cover art showing rape and massacre of female bodies, he also performed with a group called Putrid Liquid. Uh, one of his bandmates is taking the recordings down. He's removing them out of fear that the vulgar music he produced will make a cult hero out of the murderer who was killed by police at the scene. He's also received death threats online because of his association with the killer. Uh, now, the, the, this guy's been writing music and recording it under the name Menstrual Munchies for more than five years and says he did it mostly as a joke and is now sickened by that Betts apparently took it all seriously. Uh, I feel shitty having let him in the band doing those lyrics, he said, uh, because I know, like, whereas I saw it as a joke, he, like, let's play this and we'll shock some people. Then the people will know that we were laughing about it. He didn't see it as a joke. He was like, fuck, yeah, we're going to do this. It's like, Jesus Christ, how much of this was real life for him? In addition to scrubbing the Internet of the band's recordings, he is reaching out to anyone who hosted his songs or videos to ask them to remove those, too. I took it all down. I'm trying to get everyone to take all of it down. I don't want to be associated with it. I don't want it blowing up. I don't want him romanticized. I don't want any of this romanticized. I want people to erase him from history. Now, the porno grind scene is, uh, it exists in obscure pockets of the larger, just stay over there, Tanner. Do not walk into frame on the camera. Uh, I know, but still, I'm going to say cock and you're going to laugh and <laughs> that's how it is. So Grindcore uh, it consists of a handful of bands who often play shows to each other or small audiences. Even better known bands in the genre writ large, such as the Germany-based Cock and Ball Torture, have just 10,000 <laughs> thousands of fans. One. You guys are so immature. <laughs> Menstrual Munchies often performed with other regional acts like Necro Cannibal Ass Grinder. <laughs> Could you guys please be serious? That Stop. was my Xbox Live name for a while. Uh, Stop. This is serious. Bill Nye, the Nazi spy, and Cunt <laughs> Torch. Good. Cunt Torch. 
playing festivals like that's the, an all ginger band <laughs> playing fields uh playing festivals like the porn fields of illinois grind fest <laughs> porn field. or uh former venue in columbia missouri called ups under the porn shop named for its location beneath a mega store a porn shop uh owned by the mother of fellow scenester zach walton of the band groin mallet in a phone interview, Walton, who has booked the menstrual munchies at the venue, said the porno grind scene is tight knit and that he and his friends have been devastated to learn what the kid did. But he doesn't believe the content of the music contributed in any way to any of his actions. It's just the music we love, you know, like it's fun to play. It's energetic and there's nothing else like it. So we play it, Walton 29 said. And then we get people like this who, you know, are fucking sick in the head who get into our scene and ended up killing nine people and almost, you know, putting a bad name on our scene. <laughs> Count Waffle 48. <laughs> right. right. And shut up. And that's not fair for the rest of us. We're just out here trying to sell records, bro. The shooter was not involved in any of the writing or recording, but only performed as a live vocalist for Menstrual Munchies. Nevertheless, he said uh, he removed the band's Facebook, Bandcamp, YouTube pages from the web, but uh, several saved versions can be found uh, of the sexually violent and demeaning album titles and artwork many of the band's song are still active on other websites the members of putrid liquid did not respond to a request for the comments through the through their band camp their manager didn't that's, reach out yeah that's not right I, i'm you're gonna tell me shut the fuck up but if you remember gg allen and the murder junkies back in the 90s mm -hmm. nobody gave a fuck back then so why are they throwing a fit now tipper gore did well tipper gore was bitching about yeah, fucking video games uh, <laughs> um, Twisted Sister. Man. Yeah, we're not gonna take it. Um, Gigi Allen was throwing shit at people. So we'll talk. There's a we'll, big difference about that. What are you eating? All right. Why your milky was? Kyle, he couldn't. Mi <laughs> He's begged me for months for a shot. He <laughs> said, "Give me a shot. I want to come back." Tanner on wall hashtag, and he has done nothing but misbehave all night long. <laughs> You did, you, the first half was great. You were great in the first half. It was riveting. It's the sugar, man. You're falling apart, son. Uh, Gigi Allen and the Murder Junkies are coming to Chicago. No, they're not. <laughs> yes, they are, dude. <laughs> I don't Go think Gigi at, Allen is. He's dead. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but seriously, the, the Murder Junkies are they coming to be, Chicago. Case in Port, if, yeah, and you can see Gigi Allen when you go to Port Fest. All right, so back to the story. Anyway, the, uh, the guy says he feels conflicted. On the one hand, he believes music and art do not cause people to commit murder. But on the other hand, he feels guilty for having associated with someone who carried out violence similar to the kind he portrays in his songs. Uh, he said he contacted the Dayton police immediately after hearing the news, but they hadn't replied to him, although he said the FBI visited his home on Monday to interview him. Uh, looking back, there were some clues that things weren't right with the shooter. He was a loner, emotionally withdrawn, and with both his bandmates and the others in the scene. Now, the shooter once brought a handgun on a tour to Iowa and suggested to others they rob some gas stations, something the band guy said he chewed the shooter out for but didn't take seriously. I'm trying to edit out all the names. Uh, he said he and others had recently distanced themselves from the shooter over his bizarre behavior, including talking in realistic terms about the violence depicted in the music, telling stories and uh, about his past methamphetamine use. Uh oh, Kyle. Uh, Shocker. And lying about his criminal record. He said the shooter also told them about a previously reported incident in which he was suspended from his high school for keeping a hit list and rape list of classmates. He wanted to commit violence against them. And he, the shooter had mentioned to the bandmate that he was depressed. Sounds like uh, Levi Prince. Still, he didn't think that he was capable of this kind of slaughter. Uh, the bandmate didn't think he was. I, I think he decided that he was going to kill himself and was like, I don't have the balls to do it. So he drew a gun. And the man speculated. The band hadn't been active since uh, the founder found out in July that uh, the shooter had contacted showgoers online after a recent gig and asked them to send him money on PayPal. <laughs> something the band guy <laughs> found obnoxious. Now, the music was created to be controversial. 
Uh, it, it was inspired by the world of shock rock acts like Mentors and Gigi Allen. Oh. He often played fully naked wearing an executioner's hood. In a video, they can be seen performing in nothing but Santa Claus beards and hats. If the goal was attracting controversy, they succeeded. The band guy said even some of his close friends found the misogynistic imagery to be too much. Now, the scene is sure to be examined in a national conversation as social critics point to toxic masculinity as a root of gun violence. The shooter apparent political beliefs were also drawing scrutiny. He identified anti-fascists and slaughtered Nazis and gun violence in social media posts that have since been removed by Twitter and Facebook. Uh, some of the political right have seized on that to infer his ideology as part of his motive. That's the first time we get to his political motive. If you look at the last article about mass shootings on, Vi uh, on uh, Vice's website, it's far right shooters are, you know, so predictable. Um, so one of the anti-fascist, uh, one of the bands, extreme metal band, Neckbeard Death Camp, uh, <laughs> distanced themselves in a tweet from their scene. Oh, turns out the Dayton shooter was literally effing, effing F. Uh, Neckbeard Death Camp wrote in a sense deleted tweet. I don't know if I would use the term leftist to designate one of the dudes in the menstrual munchies. Anti-fascist, <laughs> sure, but not great with women. Just another dime a dozen Ohio grind dude who caped progressive politics while treating women like shit. The band continued in another tweet. Uh, they followed up saying they didn't know the shooter. Um, Ryan Ward of the Ohio-based Cunt Torch, a band that regularly played with the menstrual munchies, like in the coming backlash to how Marilyn Manson and South Park were blamed for the Columbine shootings, although he acknowledged that it is somewhat different because a member of a band committed the heinous act, just not a fan. Uh, still, he finds it hard to believe that the dehumanization portrayed in the music contributed to an environment in which the shooter felt desensitized enough to commit actual violence himself, including shooting to death his own sister and her boyfriend, two of the victims of this rampage. Part of the music is you want to figure out, he says, ways to portray people as being dehumanized as much as possible or, you know, degraded. A sexual dehumanization objectification is a big way of doing that, Ward said. If for some reason the music he made or whatever somehow did do that for him, I feel that it is an exception, not the rule, when it comes to people making this music. I feel it's our responsibility to make it a point to let people know that, no, this is not what we actually stand for. Our songs aren't prophecies. You know, they're like not fucking ominous fucking messages that are supposed to come true. They're just songs. So that leads into a... He probably didn't write the lyrics. No, he didn't. It's, it said he didn't. But this leads into a broader discussion that's kind of going on. What motivates these guys to become mass shooters? We're going to do that show for you on Saturday. I will be here uh, uh, doing that. But it, it's, you know, the president blamed video games. The Democrats blamed Trump's rhetoric. The uh, You could make the case that the Dayton shooter was a copycat of the El Paso shooter I, was kind of activated by that. He feels more to me. I don't, this is my opinion. I think he was more trying to, like suicide by cop or something. Right. That's what I with think you. it sounds like. But, I don't know. I, to be I, honest, if the minstrel monkeys were playing at the town tavern, I'd probably go see him. <laughs> that sounds hilarious. But it, it so I had was long, obviously crazy though. I, mean, I had a yeah, long discussion. Insane. Yeah, I had a long discussion with Reinhold in the group about this. I, I was like, okay, so 8chan and the white supremacist groups, or ISIS, and uh, you know the Muslim cleric, or or the Christopher Cantwells of the white supremacist world, who like groom these guys, who find these disaffected lost guys, uh, or video games and the repetitive dehumanization that you see if you're constantly playing shooter games and, and have no friends, I guess, or music like this that is inherently dehumanizing. Are, are you, I, I don't know what, if there is a debate because it's probably a gray, not black or white. Some of this stuff, this, ki this kid was attracted to this music because it's who he was. There's a theory that the reason that crime has greatly dropped and that rape has dropped specifically in uh, the world is that access to porn has increased and so people uh yeah, they don't have any time to go out raping with all the porn to be watched <laughs> they're not I mean, really there's rape what, porn for uh, them to watch tanner please mute your mic for Stop. them Shh. to make quiet so there's the the reality is that people are seeing their pro proclivities in private and they're not going out and acting them out like that's you know for these guys it's a joke 
for this guy, it's it's what he's into. And that's sort of the problem with the white supremacist stuff and the jokes on 8chan and what's going on with like this particular music. Like 1%, 10%, we don't know. They're not joking. So 90% no, you're looking at you're looking at percentage points of a point. Yeah, probably they're gonna act I on mean it. hell right. even if it was two percent me and Tad that means the ninety eight others are so innocent. so I, I guess we'll we'll start to wrap up because we're way over time, but what is what kind of the final question that I want to ask you guys, and maybe I'll ask Carrie to weigh in first. How do you balance a society? Uh how do you protect people's rights? The right to free speech, particularly in this instance. How do you protect the ability for people to speak freely in a society while protecting us from the one percent that in, uh, engage in that rhetoric or engage in those things? I mean, I, I, I think that's the question. That's one of the big questions we ought to be having. Like gun confiscation is just a conspiracy th theory at this point. It's not going to happen, but. I, I think that the idea that there are a lot of guys being groomed by these violent, dangerous ideologies in whether it's Syria or El Paso or Chicago, even like ha young men are attracted to violence because of certain maybe biological issues or uh, sociological issues. It's a very complex problem and it doesn't have a very easy solution. And so as we continue to have this conversation, as we will, how do we do that? How do we protect ourselves while balancing rights, specifically free speech on the Internet, Harry? All right. The thing is, when you're going after percentage points, if, if this thing, let's say this thing did cause, this, this radicalization of these jokes, these memes did cause anything, right? then we would probably have people doing this in droves. It's just the same way we would lo we lost all the people who used to scream YOLO. You don't hear it anymore because we lost all those people. You know, um, it's... Meaning they died? <laughs> <laughs> That's the whole thing. You only live once. Yeah. You're <laughs> out. A lot of them. Um, Solid joke. <laughs> <laughs> the thing that I wanted to get with is people make these, so many people make these jokes and they just go about their day. They will make some awful joke that's off color. I don't know why they make them. I don't make them myself, but people make them. And they keep moving around their day. You know, so many people who, who have mental illnesses, they, and they go about their day. You know, it's, it's just too small percentage point. Until, and, and they've got these hypotheses on why people do these type of things. I think there's probably more into suicide by cop than anything or just people just not feeling attached to society for some reason. There's other issues there, but I think, but I always feel the easy blame is to let's blame the memes. Let's blame the gun and let's blame other things that are easy. They're right in front of us. Um, this way, like, and the one thing people like doing and they were like pushing the, like these red flag logs, which are freaking scary as all heck, but you know, it's, it's people want to be looking like they're doing something right now. So it, it's, if the in order to protect it's easy to protect free speech on the internet just let the you know back off let let site mods do what they do if people want to mod it take it down and allow people to speak the best way to take down any idea we've said it before is just let them speak let them talk about it let them bring their bad ideas out and get it up and we will shout them we will shout their bad ideas down not because we're silenced, it's just because their ideas are just bad, you know. And I'd rather them speak about it than sit there and like in their little, you know, you know, hate dens, and they sit there in the hate den and they decide, you know, like, oh, I'm going to go do this, you know. I, I'm hoping they find a, yeah, you know, actually now they've caught some of the, a lot of these mass shooter types alive that they can figure out what made them tip, what actually made them go after it, and I. And you can't say it was like was mean because we've had you know we've had them for a while because you can't blame memes you can't blame the jokes. Uh, uh, but is there an argument to be made that because there is an element of finding 
for me, I think a lot of this is, uh, uh, for whatever reason, a lot of these guys don't think about how, uh, especially if you're over 35, 40, like you had a lot more uncles around, you had a lot of mm-hmm. uh, family around, you had a lot, a large, more community organizations, community institutions. You had more people kind of nudging you and going, no, that's not how we act. That's not what we do. That's not how we, you know, and it's so easy for young men today to kind of slip into isolation. They, the only time that they actually get any kind of contact with other people uh, is it, it, like this Dayton shooter seems to me like the kind of guy who, even if he had tried to go out and find community was so bizarre that he wouldn't be accepted by it. And so he just stays isolated. And the only place that he can really find any connection with people is online in some of these darker places of the internet. And so he wants to show off for those people. He wants the social proof that comes with being one of their heroes because he looks at the Christchurch shooter or the El Paso shooter and says, I want to be like Dylan on Dylan Klebold, the, the, the Columbine shooter. I want to be like, you know, the Jonesboro shooter, like that. I think I, tribalism has a lot to do with it. Too. I, I think, right. I think so. I think there is. So should, if 8chan is a place where these guys feel that they can show off and, and be a, a big hero in their community, should those places exist? Like, it's not a matter of should the government shut it down? That's an absolute no. Absolutely. But should the free market take care of, places the free market took care of h and it's down like the the lost their domain you know should well, the, for should the should i mean people can voluntarily disassociate themselves with a place like an h chan but should yeah. these places exist i mean i know probably what you guys are going to say is they'll just move to some other place which is really no the, the truth. there will yeah. be another place and i mean like you know yeah and they've got their tour address still their tour still up so well they're there's more well, the yeah tour. these guys well, and that's part of the problem there, is why well, you don't see as much of it in the, the problem isn't the posting it's the actual going out and doing the it's the doing action the, but, yeah. yeah well the, the thing is all right so like the, then you're going to like a, a the idea of men's issues that's when people will now want to know like what's going about this but because men have been, have been committing suicide in droves of the last decade Which especially really, if they're veterans you okay? want to talk about and the, no one really like no one right. wants to point and talk about it all they want to do is look at white men or men in general and just kind of demonize them it's like you're bad you're the bad you're made everything bad you're worse than the baddest thing that we can think of okay Oh. And if you want to see how bad it's going to get, the International Conference of Men Issues is coming up. And it actually going to talks about a lot of these things you're talking about, but no press is on about it. The only press you're going to hear about it is people protesting the event and trying to get it shut down. Absolutely. And if you're a depressed, suicidal male, you're like, at what point do I just go out and take some other people out with me? I mean, and why, not, why not? You know, I'm 22. I was, um, see, I was 20, 20 years old, and I had two friends commit suicide hmm. and uh yeah. they 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 both happened within two years both males yeah and um that i can remember neither of them were on prescription medication neither of them took prescription drugs or street drugs one of them was an alcoholic and the other one i was there and he took too much well deaths deaths of despair overdoses suicides are have astronomically risen in the last Mm -hmm. decade or two to the point that now the the uh average age for an american has decreased our life expectancy in america has decreased three of the last four years he was 22 two two of the last three i think actually to be to be fair uh and it and yeah like the real skirt like not diminishing or min- minimizing these mass shootings because it's certainly an issue that society needs to deal with suicides make up a significantly larger portion of gun deaths oh, it's absolutely. the largest portion the second is gang related which drug war related basically Correct. and then the issues of domestic violence where i think that's around 1900 a year where you know men are 
men and women are killed in domestic violence incidents. The numbers, I believe it's under 300 yeah. for a ma- technical mass shooting where like right. six people are wounded. Right. I know somebody. Right. And that's the, the calculation oh, of what on. you can actually define what a mass yeah. shooting is. Yeah, everybody's got a different, depending on your agenda, I think it, there's a different. Uh, well, and if you look at the definition, you know, the, if you right. look at the list of mass shootings every single day this year, but then you look at the actual like underlying data of why that happened, it is drug war related. It is, it's not these, these one-offs like El Paso that happen several times a year. Like, and the, the it, other- I think I think a lot of the media is trying to uh, like I, was, I don't know. Do you guys let me ask let me ask it this way. If like in Chicago there's a drive by and it's gang related it's retaliatory and well, seven people die is that I, is that a mass shooting in the same way that the Dayton shooter is? I think people shooter? can grasp the understanding behind they 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 chalk that up to you know violent or <sighs> not violent but obviously violence but you know a crime drugs whatever. Right. There's a there's a reason there's a reason that someone got shot. Yeah, I mean, like, what scares the shit out of people somebody. is when you're Hold on, Tanner. What scares the shit out of people is you're literally dealing with a small percentage of the population is crazy to begin with. There's a super small percentage is going to act on that, mm-hmm. and those are the people that go out and do it, these shootings. You know, I mean, right. there, there's literally nothing you can do about it. That's why it's so scary. I I, I agree. I think the reason that we we don't get wigged out by there's no uh, a, a, dr- a drug war shooting basically there's is some that, type of that, that registers right there's a framework sense. in our mind for that, that but the, 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 someone walking into a walmart and shooting people shooting a two-year-old that right. i mean how does there's no sane person that can even wrap their mind right. and you'll never know you'll never know what was going through that guy's head even though they caught him alive the ohio the ohio one's kind of crazy it's like what what is the purpose you shoot your sister her boyfriend and like what right. you know it doesn't register which it never will because the, we we these still are crazy i think that's another thing is that we and that's why i want to do the show this weekend about this i don't really think i've never heard a good explanation we could just get we just jump right to guns but we never actually have the conversation about like why did the charleston or the texas or the it's Columbine. Like we see these manifestos, but like, no, ha- has there ever been? Is research? that? Have you ever read a manifesto and said, you know what, that, that there, that's sensible? There's I've never been. Read. No, there's no. It's no, fucking There's crazy. never been a good story. But one of my friends died in a shooting, and uh, he, I wouldn't say he was a drug addict. He wasn't one of the two that I mentioned earlier. This is a third guy. His name was Chance Smith. He was at his friend's house who happened to deal in meth. And um, apparently that friend had made a threat to another guy. And that guy acted on the threat with two other friends of his. And um, they showed up at the guy's house, pulled out a gun, and exchanged gunfire. Well, my my buddy jumped in between the gunfire and got caught Hmm. in the collarbone. And it ended up hitting his heart, and he died. So he's a victim of the drug war. Yeah, he dabbled in drugs. I'm not going to sit here and tell you he was a saint. But, you know, he, he didn't deserve to die. It was not a death sentence. And another one, you know, I mean, it it, it just happens all the time. And, and people don't realize exactly what's going on. Because if, if there was decriminalization of all drugs tomorrow, that shooting would have never happened, I don't believe. Right. If that, Ar- that if alone, Arvin Vora was president, I don't believe that would happen. That would that alone would take care of so much violence and immigration issues across all of this hemisphere. I mean, it really would. Yeah, uh, but sure. uh, you know, I don't know. I just look at this and I go, <laughs> "This is a large, complex problem." The gun debate thing. I I don't think they want to have a conversation. It's always just take the guns. It's, right. It's, that's the first thing, and like you'll hear, like the Democratic debate. It's like. Which is which is foolish they just to stop keep you because hitting the same nail. So, so what are you going to do? You're going to take. Well, so what yeah, they want? Let, let's go door to door. Is what Kamala Harris said. Yeah. Okay. So to save hundreds of lives a year, we're going to expend thousands of lives a year from both police officers and gun owners who are not giving up their guns. I mean, to to Kamala Harris saying that she's going to just comp, like she's just going to take executive action, subvert the Constitution. That's the dictator. That's the dictator. Uh, that she's the reason why the Second Amendment exists. More like dictation. <laughs> They're pushing her really happened. hard too. They're pushing her 
hard. Like, yeah. Well, Tulsi bagged her and threw in the fire. So, dictator uh, Harry, and a dick Harry, taster. <laughs> Harry, you wanted to jump in here. Well, I was just going to say, like, and that just shows you, like, the, yeah, I was going to say, like, the dictatorial control of them and why the Second Amendment is so important because they're so thirsty after the second that, you know, that's that one should be one of the hardest to go after. And once they do it, you know, what's the first, third, the rest of them will just go after that. And they have systematically, the state has just been encroached on all of those. The one last thought I did while I was trying to wrap up is the whole the suicide thing with when it comes to gun deaths is that just because it's people people like to say like well it's easy access to a gun well people in japan don't have easy access to the gun and that's why they have a suicide forest a suicide forest oh yeah and they made a movie about it the forest is that the jake what is paul the suicide paul? is that the jake and logan paul video yes yeah. Yes, yeah, yes, they, yes 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 <laughs> yeah and they just go out there and they kill themselves yeah, they go. young men just go up hang themselves yep. it's yeah. like their work schedule out there is insane you know, a lot of them. it's hot yeah yeah, but they've also gone through almost the exact same thing we've went through. They're just several years, decades ahead of us. They've gone through a, a decade of no growth, massive debt, can't own anything, massive work schedule, can't do anything. Bro, have you played? They, they already have Neats and Hikikomoris, just, or we call them incels, but they have the same Neats and Hikikomoris. What do you think? Oh, hentai we call them incels. All right. Well, we got to start wrapping up. It's been a long one. I feel like we solved nothing, but I feel like uh, are we ever gonna solve anything? No, dude, you had me, you had me on, dude. I th- I want to commend you. Uh, you know, even though I've yelled at you a few times, I love you, Spangle. I love, I you love too. all of the listeners, most of them. I love mittens. All right, know, especially. Let's start wrapping up, Tad. Final thoughts. Final thoughts as far as the shootings go. I want. Well, first of all, glad you're here. Glad you. Uh, Glad you're sober. God Glad you got you. clean. God bless. Uh, yeah, as far as the shooting, I, I think you literally have, you have to look at it objectively and look at the numbers. And, I mean, it's tragic. That's what makes it so tragic is that it's not like a car wreck, you know, that, or something right. that can happen. It's just random as shit. Yeah. And, oh, another thought I had was Neil deGrasse Tyson. That Did you see his tweet that he yeah. got bitched mm-hmm. at? Smash ba- mouth. Basically said, yeah. yeah, smash mouth said, fuck you, uh, yeah, it, he put out facts and uh, basically... He literally put out the numbers. Everyone of, was mad, yeah. Yeah, and I, I just thought, I was like, wow, if this isn't... Yeah. I was like, how are you going to... Th- that? You can't even have a conversation, really, about it because it's... Every side is so heated and they want to... fuck! They wanna, if you play with the mittens, you get burned, man. You want to... <laughs> they want to break it down into their side. You know, it's just... I mean, at least here we can, you know, talk about it and pretty much everybody's on the same page. But I, I don't know. I don't think you're ever gonna. There's a certain percentage of crazy people and that, crazy shit's a, gonna happen. You're not gonna be able to control it. You can't control I, everything I, that's gonna ever happen. The I government's know. definitely not gonna say. Save your ass, so. I know. I feel like that's really a um, a shitty thing that people don't like to hear. That is not a good answer. And it is. There may be nothing to solve this problem. There, yeah, I mean, there's not. I don't think. I I don't think that shootings are random. Like like Mr. Western does, but no, I'm not saying it's random. I'm saying there's just it's it's bound that something's gonna happen. This guy was gonna kill people. Regardless. I think you know if if the TA was consolidated, <laughs> I think there would be a giant army of them. The TA, Tart Army. Oh it's God. a callback. I think that there would be a <laughs> giant group of people. That I'm just, over here trying to tell everybody that every problem cannot be solved. And that there's no point in even trying. <laughs> and you're over here talking about the tart army. And I'm Not talking about the NPA. <laughs> All right, final thoughts. Anyway, final thoughts, Kyle. You just skipped. Um, on. I, I'm saving the best <laughs> for second to last. <laughs> um, I just think that people need to think with a level head because a lot of the times, the media will like to use tragedy or you know something to to get people more receptive to to change you know people are more willing to to sacrifice when they feel upset yeah and you you see it all the time that they they use the deaths and the children and and the pictures and and the the stories to to get people to to feel bad and and to get sacrifice their own liberties and i just think people need to i understand these tragedies are they're tragedies but we can't go crazy and and write all kinds of legislation that that would cause you know deaths on you know civilian law enforcement it, yeah. it's 
It's, it seems like to be what they want because, I mean, it's, it's a big talking point. Um, just going after the guns, and, and I feel like th- there's going to be more shootings. I think because it seems, like the, it seems like the easy answer, it seems like the easy fix, but the problem is when you tar- start talking about background checks, for instance, well, most of the people who have committed mass shootings, uh, a lot of the, bi- the bigger shootings that you've heard about, they pass background checks. Like in the instance of, uh, I think it was the Charleston shooter, he passed a background check. Uh, they just never sent the background check back. And so the gun store sh- sold it to him. And they said, well, you're not well, going to give it. Well, you look at the Parkland shooting. That guy was on nine times or wherever they called the FBI and local right. police. There's, they still did nothing and, about and, it. Right. You there's, know? So, so there's the, always hand to hand dealing. The, well, the it's system, not even about the guns. But the system, the, the solutions, the common sense gun solutions, a lot of them that are being, you know, like, you must carry insurance if you own a weapon or a license or a license or a lot of this stuff is creating hardships for a, a, a gun owner that hasn't lost their guns in a boating accident. And those are not the, those are the safe people. Like, you know, the, the people that look at you go, well, we need gun laws because my kid come over, could come over to your house and your kid could shoot my kid. And I go, that's a scenario that will never happen because if I own a gun, I'm going to be extremely safe. I'm going to uh, classes. I'm going to, I'm going to practice. That's the majority of gun owners. And you're, cre- you're creating laws because you think you have the ability to take away my rights. I'm sorry. My rights aren't up for discussion, and they're definitely not up for a vote. The, like you, That's just absolutely. the bottom line. And a lot of the solutions that people are just like, they, I think they think that if they scream loud enough and hard enough and vitriolically enough, nobody wants that to argue people, with them. people will just relent yeah, and squeaky wheel gets the yeah. grease. It's just not how it's going to work. I'm the, sorry. The, I like the talking point access to firearms. Right. It's always the access. Mm-hmm. So let's start talking about the things that most of America can agree on. Let's start identifying the warning signs of a kid like this Dayton shooter, for instance, or, what what are some ways? What are some problems in society that we can co- correct together? Because I'm not giving up my rights. It's just not up for discussion. Like I'm not even going to debate it with you, because I have an inherent right to protect myself, my family, my community, and my property. And so it's not a solution. There's no such thing as a common sense solution when it comes to stealing rights. So let's actually, if if I'm going to be intractable. Let's actually talk about the things. There's a lot of – this is a complex solution. It's not just about the tool. They're using trucks and knives and things in places where they don't have guns. Yeah, more people are stabbed to death a year than right. shot. Like, so uh-huh. it, it, is, it is a certain psychology or biology or sociological cause that is causing young men to join violent organizations of any nature. So let's figure out what that is. Let's research that. And we don't have that conversation. We don't even really know why these guys do that or what their mental, like, even after they've been in a facility like the Aurora shooter, he looks a little off, but you have no idea really what his state is or what caused him to do it. Who's doing research on that stuff? I'd love to to do more, uh, have more of a conversation about that because I want to solve this problem. I want this to stop. I want want there to be less violence. I'm a nonviolent person. I don't believe that violence is a, a tool to achieve social goals. Like, there's or political goals. Like violence is an absolute non-starter. Like if you think that using violence is an acceptable tool, uh, you're already like, lost. Y- you've already <laughs> lost. You're, yeah. you're, you've lost, you're an immoral person. And so how can we figure out how to create a system that actually solves this problem? I would start by like not letting people incite violence on Twitter because it, it's okay. Like when the left does it, and I use that term very loosely, right. but, um, it's it's okay and you know when like keywords like extermination and and uh, i can't remember the guy's name Let, let's not Talking pretend about, that yeah. violence is just the white uh, a stronghold of trump and the white supremacist yeah. movement like rand paul just had a piece of his lung removed because a person on the left kicked the shit out of him and then go look at the replies to rand paul about his announcement on it let see if that seems nonviolent and all those people like <laughs> violence is actual actually the default setting for human beings control and violence and Ain't everybody a fascist that's right. okay to punch it me. was kind of funny how right. he was like making his yard trimmings pile up and that dude's oh no well it sounds like yeah but there's <laughs> no reason for it it was hank hill versus so. Rand paul 
uh, finish your thought, and then we're going to go yeah, to Santa. Yeah, uh, just uh, – I'm trying to ruin the guy's name. He's got, got like, over 100,000 followers on Twitter. But uh, just inciting, you know, calling Trump supporters, you know, racist. They're all racist. Reza all Aslan? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and saying that they, they need to be exterminated. And, and that type of, right. you know, that type of verbiage out there, the, the crazy people that see that, they're going to feel emboldened. You know, there's someone else that feels like me. And the, when their rules aren't enforced on when – when their rules are enforced on one political side but not on the other, that has a galvanizing, mobilizing effect on the other side. And that's what I don't think that people who are in these big tech companies oh, understand. There's going to be blowback eventually. Yeah. And so that's why you get people shooting up YouTube like that crazy woman who got demonetized. God, she was hot. Stop. <laughs> All right. Final thoughts, Tanner. <laughs> you know, thank you guys. You know. All one quarter of you that remember me, thank you. The three quarters that don't remember me, thank you for listening to me. Arvin 2020. There's my official endorsement. Um, thank you to Tad West. Literally thank, the first endorsement of Arvin ever. Thank you to Mr. Spangle who let Besides me on his show. Um, hell, I'll even thank Jeremiah. Thank you, Jeremiah. You gotta um, kiss the the boss hog ring. You right. gotta kiss it. You, know, you, you gotta kneel and kiss the boss hog ring. And uh, it's been a good time. It's been a long time, but it's been it's been good to be here with a clear head to actually get my feelings out. Um, these shootings are absolutely ridiculous. Um, and I I I don't I don't think that gun control is gonna fix any of that. I think that if anything, it's gonna make it worse. So, arm yourselves, arm your children, arm everybody, and train them to use the guns properly. And that's the only way I think that this can be fixed. That's my final thoughts, and thank you. All right. Uh, Harry? I'm going to need you to turn on your mic, or what are you doing over there? I don't know. He's a moving target, though. Oh, I said I said I did like I gave my final spiel yeah, before. You guys just kind of jumped in everything. Oh, Harry was first. Yeah, I kind of oh. said everything, and then everybody just kind of like piled into that. Like that was my that's my final thought. That's, that's what hey, I did. Even said Harry first. Yeah, I know, right? All right then. All right. Thanks for joining us here on We Are Libertarians. Thank you, uh, Tanner. It was great to see you here. Uh, Kyle, it's nice to meet you. Harry, always a pleasure for you not to be here and tad it was great to see you as well so it's great seeing you thank you everybody for listening don't forget to go and subscribe to all the we are libertarian podcasts we appreciate you all so much and we will talk to you soon okay everybody hold keep those racial slurs in <laughs> 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 Harry. I was hoping you would, Harry. Harry. I didn't want to have to. Harry, you can get away with it. <laughs> but anyways, if you do go to the International uh, Conference of Men's Issue, Carl Benjamin is going to be up there in Chicago. Carl Benjamin, like the star gun of a, a, a yeah, star star gun. Yeah, yeah. yeah, he'll be in Chicago for the inter International Conference of Men's Issue. Oh,